Welcome back to The Debrief, as it's known in the sport. This is your quintessential podcast. We're talking about competition climbing uh, for and by people that love competition climbing, not just those that are around for the Olympics. Uh, joining us this week is kind of the dean of the guests of this show, is uh, all the way from New Zealand right now, is uh, Eddie Falk coming to us from Auckland. He is the, the editor, the publisher, the creator of the Circuit Climbing magazine. Uh, he's been on the circuit for years, shooting photos, telling stories, and as always, our co-host, Host, who is a complete backstabber and has joined another podcast since the last time we spoke. His name is John Bergman. I'm not going to promote his book this time because I'm salty about it. But if you want to hear John sing on podcasts, listen to either the most recent or the second most recent episode where uh, where you can hear John serenade us with uh, a jingle from the 80s or 90s. Which yeah. climbing, climbing Gold is the name of this show. Okay, sure. You can plug it on this show too. Whatever, man. That's fine. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll just delete that yeah, out. We'll That's no problem. Thanks a lot. Yeah. So anyway. What, what, was it, what was it called? Climbing Mold? <laughs> anyway. Hey, now. <laughs> anyway, a good good show for the opportunists out there who uh, who will be around uh, paying attention to the sport for one more week, and then we won't see them for another three years. But anyway, uh, John Bergman uh, joining yeah. us. He's done some stuff in climbing journalism before. So anyway, that's the crew to talk about the Tokyo 2020 Olympic Games climbing's debut uh, at the Olympics. Uh, there's obviously a lot to talk about, um, and I'm gonna I'm gonna hand it over to John for the for the first headline. Uh, uh, well, yeah, let's just get started because we're, we're going to be rolling. What's up, John? What do you think? Yeah, I was kind of like you and, and Eddie. I was trying to think about what is the, the headline? What are the headlines? And I kept just coming back to the most non-creative headline of all. But it's like, let's just be honest. The big headline is that the Olympics happened. Climbing <laughs> finally was in the Olympics. And your champions are Yanya Garnbrett in the women's division and Alberto Hines Lopez in the men's division. You cannot cannot come away from this this moment thinking that any headline is larger or more significant than that and so um you can get fancy with other creative headlines and and there's certainly plenty of winners and losers to talk about but at the end of the day climbing made history it's in the olympics and you've got a men's and women's champion i i'm kind of in the same spot like the first headline i had as i was trying to think of one was like it's over like we don't have to talk about it anymore it's like finally done but when i when i followed the thread of questions it's just a couple that i put down was like all the all the things we've been claiming the olympics was going to do for us now it's like check your watch it's a waiting game is all this stuff going to happen like is are we going to see a a super explosion of climbing gyms? Is production going to get way better? Are all the athletes going to be funded, you know, way more? And also reflecting back on it was kind of, you know, I think we had really high hopes for what the Olympics was going to bring to our sport. And it these questions kind of linger in reflection, like did the production, did the route setting, did the event operations, did they really level up for this event? And I'm sure we'll talk about that. But it's I'm still kind of just kind of taking it in, trying to see what what the media world is saying at this point. You know, our, our climbing gym, because we have sick SEO is like the, the gym that all the Canadian uh, news outlets call for, like climbing expertise. Like we've done three or four interviews just since the week started, just with, you know, national media asking about rock climbing. Not so much the competitive side, but just like, you know, indoor climbing in general. So there is some kind of at least temporary media interest but at this point i'm just kind of waiting to see like is this going to bring everything that everybody promised the olympics would bring so i'm just a giant question mark yeah i'm i'm much in the same boat when i tried to think about a headline it was basically we we survived we're over the line now we can see what the future holds because that was all as you said it was a big question mark and with things like it being an outdoor venue, it being crazy hot, uh, some of the climbers not being seen in international competition for 18 months, the whole competition just was question mark after question mark. And to finally have it done and to be able to sit there and, you know, I don't think this episode should be called the debrief. It should be called the decompression. Because sure. well, it's too late like, now. I can't Rrr. edit the damn title now that I've started, but sure. <laughs> So, but I think it, it, it's a huge weight off the vast majority of people in the sport who have worked really hard on it and have a stake in it. But now it's over. We, we can just sit back and, you know, a bunch of people 
whether it be the IFSC, whether it be the federations, whether it be the media, whether it be the athletes, whether it be the coaches, have had so much invested for so long. And, and this is the chance to breathe. I gave this a couple extra days before recording, partially because like we, I had a thing yesterday and we've been reopening uh, our gym. And so life just feels really busy. Like it was kind of a, adding the Olympics just made things kind of nuts in my particular part of the world. Um, but I was also sort of hoping that I could get a better sense of how uh, how the story would play out uh, over the weekend. And I don't feel like too much has changed. You know, I haven't got a very good sense of of whether whether climbing and Alberto and and Yanya have really you know seeped into mainstream coverage outside of their own countries, where obviously it's a huge story. Um, but that's that is kind of noticeable, and it doesn't worry me. But I think it is kind of realistic that you know the Olympics comes and goes, and We'll see how somebody like Sean McCall, how how his profile changes over the next little bit. Same thing with Alanya Yip here in Canada. I'm very curious how Nathaniel Coleman's profile uh, changes in the States after this. You know, at this point, I think, understandably, all those athletes are kind of on like a, a thank you tour, like hitting all their sponsors, um, trying to trying to make sure that uh, that they're, uh, you know, locking in those deals for another four years, ideally. Um, but it'll be curious to see if we if we see them still uh, still, you know, on on these shows as as just members of uh, the general media in the in the lean years in between the Olympics. I really don't know. Um yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know much else of what to say at this point. It does. It does just feel like questions. I guess the one thing I'll, I'll throw to you two guys is where you are. How have you felt about the media reaction to things? And I'll and I'll as a just a preface of kind of like a gauge of where my head was at was going into this. We talked about, you know, it doesn't matter so much who wins or loses, because frankly, this isn't this is an exhibition comp, right? You know, hopefully it's fun to watch. It shines the right light on on the three different disciplines of our sport. Um but I was just really hoping for a viral moment, something that, you know, jumped out of the screen and was forced to be replayed over and over on every channel around the world because it would just be such an incredible human moment. Like seeing the Qatari athlete and the, uh, was it the Italian Ooh. athlete um, from, uh, from the high, the jump. high jump sharing uh, sharing a gold medal? Like little things like that where it's just the TV's so good you can't not air it, right? Um, I haven't seen too much of that from climbing, if anything. Um, have you guys noticed anything, at least where you are? Like John in the States, is Nathaniel Coleman just like trending nonstop or? His his win definitely, or his silver medal definitely feels like a, a really big deal. Um, I, I think it's interesting when you ask how the media's response has been, because this, uh, obviously everybody, time zones are bizarre and whatnot, but in the States, this, the Olympics ended a, Roughly like midday on Friday, the climbing portion, I mean, ended, uh, you know, 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock on Friday. And then and then we have the weekend. And obviously, most of these big media outlets and whatnot, they don't work on the weekends. So it's it kind of hasn't felt like it's been this overwhelming surge of media. But I also think that some of that is just because of the timing. And we had we had this bookend of the weekend. So I'm actually really curious to see what this week brings because i think this week will be really telling in terms of how how the media are treating this what the rollout is like and if it's any indication right before we started uh recording here i i had an email in my inbox about a uh some press that nathaniel coleman was available for or, you know that pr type of stuff and so so that's that's a pretty good indication for me that it's that it's rocking and rolling on his end at least eddie what about you uh, look, over here, I've just been monitoring effectively what's happening. And obviously, the first thing you know is that the Google metrics are way up for search and climbing. It seems to have had a really strong result across the non-climbing audience. Now, I don't know whether that was watching it live or whether it was watching the highlights packages. But seeing things like in the BBC in the UK where you have someone like Tim Burgess tweeting and it got reshared on the BBC coverage um, that, you know, speed climbing is the best sport he's ever seen. It's his new favourite sport. And for those of you that don't know, which you won't, living on that side of the Atlantic, Tim Burgess, um, lead singer of the Charlatans, like one of the big Manchester bands. It'd be kind of like the equivalent of the singer of Maroon 5 or something in the US going, hey, this is the best sport ever. So we, we're getting that sort of, sneak into normal culture um i have seen a lot of positive news out of it sadly i've also seen 
a bunch of negative and quite often that is where the only thing the media have had to work with is the comments of the climbers themselves and so you end up with some quite questioning pieces uh, which I don't think reflects the quality of the event I think it reflects the confusion of the media when they go that was great and then they look at what the athletes said and said go well was it great can you get can you give some uh, examples of climbers uh, quotes that come to mind when you when well, I think it's the Adam Andre quote, is it not? It's yeah. like, you know, it's Adam okay. just saying like That's speed, you yeah. know, I can't a even Adam remember the Colin quote, Duffy but we all know the, the two quote. big ones. Sorry, what was the second? Yeah. Uh, Colin Duffy. There was a lot of talk oh, about after Colin the event, very, right? very openly saying, you know, he beat the people that beat him in two of the three events and yet he wasn't on the podium and they were getting medals. Right. Um, and so I did see a bunch of media where people were going, Climbing is great, but the format seems really flawed because this is what the athletes are saying. Yeah. And, you know, I think we can come back to the Adam thing later because I've got that. That is the only athlete-related thing I've got in my losers. Um, but on the whole, I think we're going into a whole rabbit hole that we could go down for a long time. But the information available from the media has very much been hearsay and... Um, picking up what they can from wherever. So you're getting quite a disjointed media coverage after the event when people are reviewing it because they're obviously looking for information and just writing out what each other have said right? Um, rather than having an overarching storyline that's been dictated to them by a federation which they can then sell to the world. Right. Yeah, that's that's fair. I mean, it as as much as Adam's comments were like, I think that was like years ago that those those comments that he made and whatever that I can't remember if it was in his own series, his like Road to Tokyo series, or if that was like an Epic TV interview or whatever. Um, but yeah, those comments do not die. The the Colin ones are too bad because that's that's where that context of you know he just missed out on a huge prize. But the, the context missing being like all the climbers understand that this is a one off event and they're never going to do it ever again. Right. And it sucks that he didn't win gold because that would be amazing. But it's not really a reflection of him as a bad climber. It's just, you know, this is yeah, that's it's too bad that the full uh, picture isn't painted with those yeah. remarks. I mean, in the case of the Adam one, it's actually mostly in regards to what was posted on social media after the games. Oh, okay. Um, which, of course, then they always have the qualifier at the back saying um, that this is by the Adam. Um, during the Olympic Games, all Tokyo Echoes news is brought to you by Adam team members. Yeah. So you could go, well, it's not Adam. But the I've seen it shared a lot on Instagram and on Facebook where climbers are going this is not the way to be a gracious loser because basically he's just saying that he lost because the others got lucky. Yeah. He's um, just burning the podium underneath him. That kind of sucks. Yeah, which is, you know, very disrespectful being that he only did as well as he did because of the misfortune of others. Very true. So. Yeah, speed, speed's been a fun one. We'll talk about that some more, yeah. Um, the, the one other point I just wanted to bring up because it's, it's really, I'm concerned about it from my area and it might be relevant for others is that it sucks that at the time when we might be about to profit, like, you know, the indoor climbing industry might be about to profit off of uh, a huge boom of interest is a time when I'm forced to ask you to make a reservation and I have capacity limits and I can't, you know, there's our offering is completely shrunk. It's very difficult to get kids in right now um, because when you need a parent with every kid, the capacity really messes that up. It sucks. And I'm desperately hoping that the interest carries over to a time when we can actually welcome people to a full service gym with all of the classes, all of the events, all the competitions. Like Canada hasn't had a competition in, in like a year and a half or whatever, right? Like it's it's been really dry over here. Um, and depending how things go over the next couple months, that streak might be extended. Um, and so I'm desperate that if there were kids that watched and saw, whether it was Sean or Alana or somebody like Alberto or whoever, I'm really hoping they hold on to that desire to try the sport because I'm really afraid that a lot of parts of my country and maybe other parts of the world just like won't be able to offer a good starting experience for these people. And that's just bad luck. But um, I mean, it's really too bad after, so, you know, we've so many gym owners have been have been, you know, saying that this is going to be their, you know, uh, they're either, you know, the golden goose. Right. And uh, yeah, it might might be a big change to that. 
Um, yeah, let's uh, let's talk about winners and losers because I feel like, frankly, we might go through multiple of them for uh, for each of us. Um, Eddie, let's start with you. Uh, let's start with uh, who you, and and this is one of those things where there's so many winners. It is really about picking who you think like the biggest winner is, and that's hard oh. by itself. So tell me what you think. Exactly. When I look at my list, I have uh, five winners, um, which normally after a World Cup, you can isolate down to one. Now, one of the reasons I've got five winners is my first winner is each and every single climber for making it to the Olympics. Because the fact that we had no withdrawals, no pullouts, no one didn't make it in the end, they all got up there and showed what it meant to them and conducted themselves for the most part incredibly well um yeah i think for those climbers it's something that can never be taken away from them they're all olympians now regardless of result and they all look like they belong so yeah my number one winner has to just be the climbers john what about you who uh, who came across as your big winner uh well um there's so many. <laughs> I feel like we might have to just leave the obvious ones and say, yeah, Yanya, yeah. Alberto, like thumbs I, I, up, right? I, but so I want to put I, I want to put Yanya and Alberto to uh, to the side for a second because sure. I think that there they, there's so much to discuss about each of them, not only individually, but I I also think it's worth discussing like them together and how their their gold medals you know, the context is similar or different for each right. of them. Well, we'll say, um, let's all do our winners. We're going to save those two for after we've yeah. done our other winners. Yeah, let's do it. Well, one of the, 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 um, the winners that I have to mention is Akio Noguchi, uh, because Tyler, I remember when she announced her retirement and you made her retirement video. Oh, I did uh, one for Shauna, not for Akio, but yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. That, that, that's right. You didn't make one for Akio. Thank no, you. You yet. didn't make one for Akio. And we were saying that, and to take nothing away from Shauna, of course, but we were saying like, well, maybe you shouldn't make one for Akio yet because it still feels like she might have something, you know, do something incredible. In <laughs> says a lot about what I thought for Shauna at the Olympics, unfortunately. No, I don't think at all. I, I think, I mean, Akio, she gets, she got second place at the Hachioji World Qualifiers, right? So there's like statistical, and and she won the the Japan Speed Cup and stuff. So there's like statistical evidence that she could really possibly she could have possibly won gold at the Olympics. And again, like we, you know, everybody here loves Shauna. So I don't want it to take anything away from her. But the point is it, it kind of felt like even though she had, Akio had announced her retirement, she still might do something great. It's like, let's not get on that retirement train quite yet. And that proved totally, totally truthful. Uh, she ends up having pretty much one of the best ways that you can end a career ever, a competition career, in actually making the podium. Um, it's it's almost fitting that she gets bronze because it's like Miho, who gets silver, is is kind of thought about as, in some ways, Akio's successor on the Japanese team. Certainly not necessarily stylistically and whatnot, but just in terms of maybe like the next big team leader. And, and kind of the next veteran on that on that team and everything. So Akio just barely edges her out and gets the silver. Uh, Miho does, I mean, and, and Akio gets the bronze. It, it just, it was a wonderful ending to a career. Everybody here and probably everybody watching is just a huge fan of Akio. She's, she's a legend. She's got a monstrous fan base. There's really nobody that can ever say anything bad about her in terms of the, the ambassador that she has been for this sport. So I was just so happy to see Akio get on the podium there. And it's it's not only deserved for these Olympics, but as much as you can deserve a, a medal for a whole career, it's like, you know, it's great. It goes to Akio. Considering, you know, how long that she's been. And I think here, I, I'm not going to say too much about this, but the, like the term legend gets thrown around like crazy. And I've, I've started kind of voicing my opinions. I think we use the term legend a little bit too lightly with some people, but I'm sure all of us can agree with a career that's lasted as long as hers, you know, I, it's 17, 18, something like that years at this point. And she was relevant for the last 15 of them, right? Like that's a remarkable time to be right at the top. She is certainly one of the legends of, of the sport. And that's just within like, you know, if, 
she, she, that's almost entirely just within her bouldering. You can take out her lead climbing and she's like just a legend just in a single discipline, right? Whereas Yanya, to, to make her as to make her the goat, as some people are saying, you kind of need to use both disciplines to get Yanya to that level unless you're projecting out into the future. But yeah, Kyo's 100% uh, one of those people. And it couldn't be, yeah, like, I mean, yeah, she could have got gold or silver, but aside from that, like it was a m remarkable podium. And certainly, like we talk about how sometimes you just get lucky with the order of the men or the women going last and you get the right podium to end it like considering how like fucking crazy the men's podium was the women's podium was a fairy tale and i like it couldn't have been yeah we had like you know like 50 grown people in the discord just all crying alone in dark basements <laughs> it was it was a great finish and that was a big part of it for sure and and, yeah. and eddie real real fast i want you to hear you speak the only thing is tyler in terms of also a key being a legend the story for how many past seasons now has been japan's team depth their team dominance aside from the coaches which of course they play their their critical role but aside from the coaches who has been leading that team i mean you you have to think that it's been a Kyo, probably like quite literally and figuratively in terms of being like a captain and everything so um that just adds to her legendary stat not only has she done well but she has she has brought along this this team this incredible depth to do well as uh, to do well also so oh, we spoke um, about this recently but like 10 years ago they were calling akio part of the golden generation when it was like her and sakuru hori and the japanese team in compared to today was so small but that was such a huge achievement for the japanese climbing generation and now look what it is and she's still the leader of it is yeah that it, exactly what you're saying like it's it's been a remarkable uh, remarkable run but yeah eddie I was just going to say one of the winners I had written here uh, wasn't naming a specific person, but I had just put the woman's podium for being what it needed to be. Oh, yeah. And I think after the men's, <laughs> that, that woman's podium kind of gave equilibrium again. Yes. Um, because the men's podium, it was completely deserved, but it felt really disjointed and unpredictable to a lot of people. Uh, whereas the woman's podium, when it was done, everyone's like, yeah, just exactly as you said, you had, you know, you had, and sorry, I hate to disappoint you gents, but I will call her a legend. You had Yanya of a legend on top. Um, you had... But wait, who's, me, who's me saying that? <laughs> By the way, I'm a, I Who think I'm, Yanya's not a legend. I'm okay with Yanya being that. called a legend. The one thing that's grinding my gears right now is her being called the greatest of all time. And I swear to God, if you ask any of the people that say that, who's the second greatest of all time? I'm pretty sure none of them would have an answer. And to me, that's a criteria. Like you got to tell me who they beat. But anyway, back to you, Eddie. I didn't mean to derail you, Eddie. But I, yeah, I think we can all agree that Yanya is legend status. Um. I, okay, good. I was just, I was just looking back into historic plastic weeklies where you guys spent a long time discussing whether Yanya deserved to be a legend or not. Sure, and yeah. It's great to know that she has crossed the line. Maybe. Um, I, am, I, think I won't protest it. <laughs> pro pro probably a harder race than like the 10,000 meters of the Olympics to cross the Plastic Weekly legend line. Sure. I try. <laughs> I try, man. I try to have a high bar. But um, yeah, so anyway, I as I said, I just put down the woman's podium for being what it needed to be because exactly as you said, Tyler, you had Yanya, Miho, Akio. You had the legend, the rising star, and just the foundation stone of women's climbing in Japan. You know, 100%. I thought that was, yeah, so that, yeah, I'm agreeing. Yeah, I'm in agreeing with John. Someone note the date and time. <laughs> All right. So my, my big winner, and this is kind of like half facetious, but not really. My winner is, is somehow the Olympic format. Um, we got through it. It got us a spot in the Olympics. All of our, you know, all of our best climbers got to participate in the process of trying to become Olympians. All the speed climbers, the lead climbers, the boulderers. Everybody was just forced to, to dig in to all the other disciplines and learn what it meant to try hard and to fail hard and find out what was beautiful about all those different disciplines. Um, and everybody had an opportunity to show their best. Um, and I think the fact that, you know, it got us to the Olympics and frankly, the plan is working. And this is like, you know, if I was if I was part of the the decision group of of what 
discipline should go to the Olympics. I would have been one of the people saying it should just be speed to start out. Like that's just my style. I think it's the sport that is the most refined and makes the most sense and needs the the least amount of work. And and I think it's the, it just fits in with the Olympics nicely. So that would have been my choice. But I can't argue with the plan, the fact that the plan is working. It looks like speed's going to get broken off for its own medals in Paris. Hopefully in 2028, all three are separate. Um, so the fact that, you know, it was a bit of a gamble. It received a lot of heat uh, when it was selected, but it looks like it's working and it's what got our foot in the door. And the people that are hopefully going to benefit most are the athletes. So I hope people like Adam, you know, appreciate the fact that this was a huge deal for everybody, including him. And, uh, and I think the Olympic uh, format or the combined format has done its job. And, and best of all, we hopefully get to retire it. Um, so it's hopefully over now. We never have to do it again. It can ride off into the sunset uh, for its uh, 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 beautiful um, final days. Um, so I'm glad it's over, but I do have to give a shout out because right now, like there's so many new people watching and there's so much discussion about, oh, the format's weird and all that stuff. But of course, most of those people haven't been talking about it for the last, you know, three years, basically. Um, so just to balance out that, that grand discussion happening on the internet, I do just want to say like, you know, it's done the job. Um, so, uh, you have to give uh, a little bit of appreciation for the fact that it got us here. So that's my winner. I, I can't. Eddie, do, would you like to speak on that? Uh, no, I, I tend to agree. I think, do we yeah. all have a couple of winners? Are we going to cycle a couple of times and go well, let's, granular, or let's, are we let's just leave, headlining? Let's leave Alberto and Akio for a second, but if anybody has any other winners they want to add, let's hear them. Well, I just, uh, yeah. want, I just want to add to what Tyler said the, about the, the format, which I think we can... we can certainly discuss, and I would imagine we will discuss this, the scoring... But I think the format it, itself, um, it it created great storytelling. Uh, it, it really occurred to me as I was watching this. I don't know if anybody else has ever thought of this before. It doesn't seem to me like it would be an original thought, but it it seems it's amazing how these the three combined discipline is a it's like a three act story or a three act play or something like that, right? And what you want whenever you have a, a good story or a good movie or a good play or whatever, at the end of it, you want to come away from it basically with two things. You want the character or characters to seem like they have changed for better or worse, right? There's some reward or punishment that results from, from the story. And B, you want to feel like you went on that journey with them. And it seems to me like that is exactly what we got with this combined format. You have, at the end of it, there's people that are have medals. There are people that are heartbroken, you know, high high spirits, low spirits, everything in between. So they've changed. Whether 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 or not they're pleased with the outcome, that something happened in that three event uh, period. And we feel it feels amazing, like we've been on this long trek with them. I mean, it's like when they're standing there on the podium. And you're like, yeah, remember back to speed climbing? That feels like it was like two weeks ago, but it was just three hours ago or whatever. It's just, it's incredible how much this combined event, this format is able to create that feeling of, of real great storytelling. On top of that, it it's wonderful. More so it worked out in the men's than in the women's, but more so in the men's when it was right down to the very, very end, right? There's so many unknowns and question marks and you can't predict it. Until Jakob gets up and, and does his ascent, very last climber, you don't know what the outcome is going to be like. And um, and even in the women's division, even though Yanya had clinched it, there were still some questions about the second place and third place and all that. So just thumbs up for the storytelling that the combined event produces. I, I don't have the tweet off the top of my head, but Natalie Berry made a tweet that's actually, you know, I think I took a screenshot of it. She she made a tweet that kind of summarized a feeling that I had that I, I hadn't really taken the time to articulate. Uh, let me read this because it fits in with the, the storytelling idea, but kind of mentions how the focus drifts because of this format. So Natalie Berry uh, tweets, I think ultimately the thing I dislike most about the weirdness of the combined format is that the focus on ranking and the maths eclipses the memory of the actual moves and performances. I found it hard to remember who did what, uh, who did what, how, and what the best sporting moments were. And I and so the way I want to tie that in is just to say I I do that resonated a lot with me because I felt like the story was coming out of where do they place 
and I have a harder time remembering what the climbs were like and, and the moments of the actual climbing because you've got the climbing on one screen, the Olympic scoreboard on the other, and a calculator in the in the third hand. And I think there there was an element where it all became about like where do they just fall in the ranking and not so much about where on the wall. That that did take away from the rock climbing experience. It was still compelling. I, I don't argue with that at all. I was fully glued. Um, but something about it was less about the climbing and it, you know, maybe that's a fair trade-off, but, uh, but in line with it, with your comment, I wanted to mention what Natalie said, cause I thought that was, uh, uh, well articulated on her part. I think a big part of that as well could come down to the presentation of the sport. Um, the fact that, especially in the men's, I think we were all watching the OBS stream. And the commentators were just constantly throwing math at us. It, it, you couldn't avoid the fact that that was the discussion, almost more so than the climbing. Uh, it felt more relaxed. I know I did some work with CBC in the background, and their commentators had made the active decision not to talk about scoring until things became clear. Um, so then you had uh, Brenda and Commander doing that, and I felt that in the women's, they were only mentioning it between climbers and it was like quite succinct and it flowed better. But the men's just seemed, it was a constant, if he gets here, then this person's here, then this person's here. If he gets to 42, if he gets to 42 plus, if he, and it was just like, oh my goodness. Mm -hmm. Because as you said, we were working that out in the background. Then the commentators were shouting at us like drunk guys in the local pub. <laughs> and it just, it was, it felt quite shambolic. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm of two minds because, li like I was just saying, it was the math that I was following, frankly. And so part of me makes it hard to, to fault them a little bit. I don't. I, I think the decision that Commander and Brenda made on the CB street, CBC stream was probably wise, especially I don't know what kind of uh, infrastructure they had behind them. But if you can't confirm the numbers, then definitely don't talk about the numbers. Um, I, I, I never bothered to fact check what the boys on the OBS stream were saying. Um, hopefully it was all accurate, but that, that is a fair point. Yeah, I'm not sure. <laughs> I, I mean, it'd be nice if something they said was accurate. But um, <laughs> no, with my understanding from the CBC stream was that that had come down from the producers and was a, a requirement of uh, commentators not to talk about it, to let the event breathe and do its thing. I think that's a very interesting and probably a good stylistic decision. Yeah, yeah. I think that's great. I think that that depends largely on who you have to then you have to have commentators like Commanda, people that know climbing that can talk about something other than the scoring. Right. If you have somebody that's having if to I, commentate <laughs> that doesn't know climbing and, and it's like, don't talk about the scoring. Yeah, right. Like, what do you talk about? So if you I, can I only talk that, about Smith Rock and Alberto Hines Lopez crawling out of a cave in <laughs> in eastern uh, Spain or something, then yeah, you're you're kind of left this, without a paddle. Speaking of which, let's. I don't. This doesn't have to transition into Alberto, but on the broadcast I was watching, they kept saying over and over that Alberto's nickname is is El Matador. Right. Now I have watched every single World Cup that Alberto has ever participated in, and. And nowhere has that been brought up that it was his nickname. Can yeah. anybody that's listening that knows Alberto or knows the <laughs> Spanish climbing scene, is that, is that his please nickname? Confirm, I, yeah. I, yeah, I, please I have, confirm, yeah. I have never heard him called that in all the World Cups I've been to. Um, you know, I've spent a bunch of time with him and no one's ever gone up and said it's the matter. You know, it, it definitely in the historic IFSC broadcast wasn't the case so I mean to me it was just a big case of cultural profiling it was like well this guy's Spanish what sure. can we call him we usually leave just the cultural like, profiling up to the DJs but this time the, the commentators got into it yeah exactly just like you know Captain America sure <laughs> good job Coleman I think handsome Squidward is still a better uh, a better a better nickname for uh, for Nathaniel with that with that chin. But anyway, um, let's uh, uh, let's let's continue talking about broadcast. Or if uh, Eddie, we we're going to talk about your next uh, big winner, which I don't know. If that's yeah, I was, was going to talk about. Um, I'm going to lump my next winners in together because they're the only specific athletes, and this may surprise people, but they're the only specific athletes I had in as winners, which isn't in any way saying that the others aren't. 
I just I think really want to they... guess now. I feel like I want five seconds to like figure out who you're going to say. But anyway, yeah, no, okay, go ahead. Well, the, these are athletes who I think are winners for specific reasons, which I'll go into. And first one I've got there is Christopher Cossa. Um, because I think everyone wrote off the continental champs very much as a joke, especially the South Africans thought they'd be there just to make up the places. And, you know, at the end of it, he came out, he was ninth in speed, 16th in boulder, 10th in lead. Yeah. So, you know, very much mid pack, which I think is an astounding achievement for what he had to work with. Um, I think he's got to be hugely proud of what he achieved. Um, another one I had down, Victoria Meshkova, very much the same. She looked strong at European champs, but everyone said, well, all the strong ones aren't there. How, mm -hmm. how relevant is it? And, you know, if it wasn't for her 15th in speed, she would have been in finals because she got 6th in Boulder and 5th in... Um, fifth in lead so i think you know as i said I, I think every climber that competed is a winner but there's some climbers that they do they go to a slightly unexpected place and those two i think deserve a shout out and the other big athlete winner i've got and it's actually plural so you can guess this one pretty easy is i think the marwin brothers just for the dignity and pathos they showed when Bassa got injured and still got up and stood on the stage with the other finalists for finals even though he couldn't compete he had earned his place he deserved to be there but it must have been emotionally so hard to know that that was over and it was such a horrific moment to watch but seeing how those two handled it and the yeah the grace and maturity with which they handled it I mean, I was already a fan club because they are two of the nicest guys I know on the circuit. But, you know, I, I signed on to this fan club for life when I saw that. I, I think that probably really helped um, Bossa. I don't know if what you'd say, sort of like elevate his his um, his status or his we've, we've talked about kind of like big media attention mainstream attention and whatnot i think he i think he played that perfectly because obviously getting injured and getting injured when he did is the absolute worst that can happen but it's kind of like well you can either turn it in sort of spin it into a, a positive or or just or just not do anything with it right you can make lemonade out of lemons or, or not and i think he did like you said eddie by by going up there anyway standing on the stage uh being you know pleasant not seeming bitter um just being really seeming that he was still managing to enjoy it all cheering on his brother it was just uh, you talk about a lot about these olympic moments that are not just the medals like these other kind of great olympic moments where sportsmanship shines through and and all that and i think bossa was a just a wonderful um embodiment of that with the grace at which he he accepted the unfortunate circumstance and everything. So, I have to imagine he's going to have a lot of question marks about, you know, how the rest of his career plays out or if it just stops here. Um, but being the oldest competitor at the Olympics, first of all, gutted that it had to happen, especially to the speed favorite who could have put on an incredible show in finals. But I think it it was fitting that the oldest, wisest guy on the on the circuit, you know, a father, somebody who who is, you know, firmly grounded in reality, um, you know, demonstrated just incredible sportsmanship. Um, I would say the same thing about Sean uh, McCall for for just beaming through the entire experience. Um, Akio, of course, made it to the podium, so it was, <laughs> may have been a little bit easier for her. But of course, she is just you know. Uh, just an image of grace. Um, so yeah, I think I was really impressed by by all of them. Mikhail Mawem, I thought he was going to end up being one of the big moments, partially because he stunned everybody in qualifiers. He like he did overperform. There's no way around it. Winning the Boulder round with those competitors in there was should have been on nobody's radar. That was not expected by. That's almost bigger than Alberto winning the entire thing. Um, and then with his brother having to pull out, like the, the storylines were, were pre-written for maybe an incredible finals. It didn't work out that way, but he was one of the biggest overperformers. And on that, on that thread, just really quickly, Anik Jobert, 
I, I know this sounds like a joke, but topping a boulder for a, a like for one of the sport, one of the speed greats, but very much a speed specialist, topping a boulder and, you know, becoming relevant and beating some of those other climbers that blew my socks off. And uh, that was just impressive and just shows like how much work um, somebody like that put into trying to be serious about the entire thing and not just banking on a one eight eight, you know, like they, they were, um, I was, I was extremely impressed by that performance. So the French team kind of knocked me out because I would have said at the beginning, unless Anna, you know, scores that big win in speed and is passable in the rest, then I would have said probably, you know, uh, Julia Chanardy after her, her good season in, uh, in 2019 might be, might be their, their best, uh, best bet, but all around the French team just kind of really surprised me. Um, so, so good for all of them. Um, and just Chris, uh, Chris Kosser also, he was a banger. Like the fact that, because I, I, I absolutely put him down at the bottom along with Tom O'Halloran. It was just, you know, I have very little, very little uh, competitions to measure you against. And you qualified right at the end. And, and you're from an area of the world where the, the uh, com, uh, competition climbing isn't very well developed. Yeah, he also was a massive overperformer. So great, great point mentioning him. Yeah, one one thing I'll add to that just quickly is provided surgery goes popular, um, properly sorry we will we will see Bessa aiming Excellent. for 2024 Great. he's he's awesome both brothers have completely announced that their goal is to go out in paris on home soil Bessa and speed and mika and combined and even since the injury they've posted that it's full speed ahead so yeah yeah fingers crossed That's for, great. Sure, for a good uh, a good surgery and a good recovery for an injury like that that's a tough one you know, Eddie, you said something really interesting, and you said that there was kind of some proof or some affirmation that the 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 continental champions really deserve to be there, which I think is a really good point because I think there was there was there were some questions, maybe not not spoken, but just kind of I think a lot of people were sort of wondering that because you have all the competitors that qualify in Hachioji. And it's like, okay, if there's a fluke, if something happens and they didn't qualify with that first group, then there's the Toulouse qualifier. They get another group gets to go through. So just by on a kind of a literal level, by the time you get to the continental championships, you're very much da systematically kind of down the tier of of people that that already had chances to qualify and could not. And so it's kind of like, well, these continental champions, yeah, it's great they got to go, but they don't expect them to compete with the people that that qualified at Toulouse or Hachioji or whatever. And that did not prove to be the case by the people that you mentioned, Eddie. And as well, I think it's worth pointing out that Colin Duffy was a continental champion. He qualified at the at the Pan Ams alongside Alana Yip, and uh, he had a phenomenal uh, Olympics, makes it into the finals at, at age 17. And so I think, Eddie, I just want to underscore everything you said about the Continental Champions. I think on the whole, just the Continental Champions deserve applause for, for, for giving it a really good fight. And, and I'm going to, sorry, I'm going to quickly add to what you said is even more of an affirmation of how topsy-turvy the qualifying can seem is two of the men's podium getters qualified through Toulouse. You yep. know, Nathaniel and Alberto, and Alberto did not qualify in Hachioji. Only Jack, only Jakob from the Hachioji qualifiers made it onto the podium. Yep. So well, really same, and show... same thing could have been said about Adam Andra, right? You know, which, which is almost an argument for needing those continental qualifiers because the fact that somebody like him... Uh, the fact that all three of those guys had to make it through the second round, it wouldn't be unconceivable that they'd make it through the third. So, yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and I have to I have to sort of uh, take back my words because I kept saying when people would ask me for predictions, one of the big things I said, as much as anybody can make predictions, I said, well, I can't help but go back to the Hachioji qualifiers, the people like Akio, Rishat Kaibulin, because they – they qualified for the Olympics when the whole field was gunning for for an Olympic spot. So I kind of, when I was making my predictions, I really weighed the people that did well at Hajioji. I, I weighed them heavily and thought that that would just be a indication of who would do well at the Olympics, right? It just kind of makes makes sense as much as you can have logic in sports predictions. Didn't end up being the case at all, which was great. It made it a lot more exciting. 
um, just goes to show you that you can't predict anything. <laughs> I, I think that extra 18 months or 12 months of preparation, whatever it was, because of COVID, definitely play, changed the playing field for some athletes. Some some were able to optimize, others dipped over. You know, maybe for a couple of the athletes that are close to the end of the career, that it made the event 12 months too late. Uh, for others that were on the ascension, it gave them that time to consolidate, you know. Does 17-year-old Alberto Guinness Lopez win gold? Maybe not. Does 18? Apparently, yes. So, you know, and same with Colin Duffy. He had that... If it had, if Olympics had happened last year, with no World Cup season, just they went, oh, we're doing Olympics anyway, and the guy had never done a senior competition except Pan Ams, then it probably would have been much harder for him. So... You know, it's an incredibly complex and unique scenario that these guys are in. The takeaway is we should have one climbing competition every two years and it'll be really good. That's the, the <laughs> takeaway for everybody will be very prepared. Anybody else have winners before we talk about Alberto and uh, Yanya? You, you got to mention Alexander Miroslav, right? Um, new world record. That that's um, and there were obviously there were Olympic records and as well, but uh, that is something that I think it's interesting because I I think we all kind of expected that the men's world record was bound to get broken this season or this year at some point because it just kind of felt like we were overdue a little bit because yeah. the last record was 2017 I think I think that's when Reza set his which is in terms of how fast. Time, how much times have improved overall since 2017? It just felt like, gosh, it's only a matter of time until until somebody um, breaks that men's record. The women's record was a little different. I, you know, I don't know if we, I don't know if I would have expected. I, I'm not surprised it got got broken, but I also could see. I, I wouldn't have been surprised if it hadn't gotten broken this whole season, right? Because it got broken a number of times in the past couple years. You think at some point it might plateau for a, for a little bit of time, but uh, the fact that it got broken, it was kind of a surprise to me, and it was awesome. Just an added element of, of excitement to the Olympics. Not not to say that it was impossible, but I, I, I do agree that I thought that, you know, my, my bet was going to be Yulia Kaplina as the speed favorite for this after Yiling Song showed a lot of promise in 2019, although there was a long break and she didn't really uh, uh, get to do much competition, I thought she might be the second favorite. So I honestly didn't consider, uh, uh, Rudz or not Rudzinska, uh, Miroslav to be um, like the, the top competitor for it. It worked out that way. And so I'm glad she got a world record there because the women's record has been consistently falling bit by bit. Mm -hmm. And I'm glad she gets a piece of it because I'm sure it will go back to a young Asian climber or back to Yulia Kaplina or possibly Anna Chobert or something. So it was nice that she got a piece of that pie and especially on this stage was really impressive. Yeah, I think with that, there's also the important thing that, you know, Ola has never had the world record mm -hmm. before. Uh, so the world record's gone back and forth between several climbers for seven or eight years that Ola's been competing. And I think she almost got the world record in 2011 or 2012. Mm -hmm. And then she never quite got there. And so for her to get it here was incredible. Um, you know, gutted for... Uh, mental blank. Yulia, or? Yulia? Yeah, gutted for Yulia Kaplina. That slip in qualifiers, I think, was a world record time. Um, I think that would have been in the six sevens that looked blisteringly fast when her foot blew off. But it's interesting that you say you wouldn't have had Ola in your favourites. I would have always had Ola in my favourites because she's the big game, big game player. She's the one that comes out in world champs and just owns. She not, she may not be the fastest, but she has that thing that is the most important thing in speed which isn't speed, it's consistency. And, you know, they, a few years ago, um, when Martin Dzinski was doing incredibly well in the men's, and all the other speed climbers just started calling him Mr. Perfect because he won four World Cups in a row. And they said it's inconceivable to win four World Cups in a row because that means you do not make a mistake for four World Cups, which is however many runs you it's not that you're necessarily faster than everyone. It's that you do that many runs without a slip, without a mistake. And 
Ola is the female version of Mr. Perfect. She just, she drills it. She does what she has to do every time. That's a which, point. which record gets broken next, uh, men's or women's world record? Well, what's our next opportunity is, is in, uh, in, uh, uh in China? Moscow. Oh, oh yeah. Sorry. The world championships. Yeah. Um, I don't know what the start list is going to look like. I honestly, I think it's in a place right now where it's a pretty even fight. I would still probably yeah. edge towards the women, frankly. Um, just cause it gets broken more often. Um, but now with the, with the Indonesian boys just setting the world on fire, I, you know, it's more likely than it was in the past. I think this not, this is not on topic, but I think that we need to look back at Reza's performance as just such an outlier, um, for, for a break that huge at that time. I think just seeing how long it's been since then, we have to either check out, like, did the, did the field just drop off since that record was broken or did he really do something like very, very special? Um, considering how long it took to break that, it's something worth some reflection in the future. But anyway, it's interesting you look back. At, it, it's interesting you frame the fact that the women's has been broken so much recently, because I kind of like I think I already said it, but I could see that going either way. Either that's sort of evidence that it probably will get broken again, or either, or you can take it as, yeah, it's been broken a ton recently. At some point, you think we're going to get something that kind of we're like holds for for a, a decent amount of time. It, it, who knows? Well, I just think I think like the with the women, it's 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 not just recently that it's been broken fairly consistently. It's been like in the last since the homologated wall started, it's they've been chipping away at the time more consistently. Whereas with men, you get somebody who just has a breakthrough. Like Rez is a great example of that, where you just bash the door down, and then it, everybody's just stunned and takes a while to have another unbelievable performance like that like it's been until now with leonardo and uh and kiramal where you say like man these guys might actually be consistent at this pace rather than reza who is never able to like replicate necessarily that pace as much as the women can replicate their world uh record performances and that's why i think i'm i'm more reliable on it um it just feels more competitive it feels like more of them are at the edge of the women's time whereas for men it takes kind of a magic run in a certain regard well, it also takes that evolution of beta. Quite often those new world records happen when there's an evolution of beta somewhere on the route. Um, so, you know, I know when the Indonesian gents came out this year, there's a new skip they're doing near, near the top of the route. Mm -hmm. And then the other teams will go and catch that up. And it it really is interesting. It, it, it brings me to a slight aside, and I'm sorry to distract here. But it's all good. Um, I don't know if anyone was saw the Canadian roundup when they were talking about Samoa and men's finals, and it just came out straight away that the Samoa skip had become the Samoa slip. Sure. Yeah, well, see, here's the thing is, I'm not sure which of us got to it first, because we were making that joke in the Discord, to be fair, and if, if Commanda said it later in a wrap up that we might have beat her to it but no it was great like because frankly making jokes on the internet is easy making jokes on a live broadcast is not so easy so yeah no it was uh it was definitely great when i saw that clip good for her i feel yeah, like some people just... would be like that's so disrespectful but I, I don't really care it's awesome well it was just savage because it was low-key savage it was completely innocently said yeah but just got to the point like you know there was no beating beating about the bush yeah, it's uh, it's that rule. You got to make sure whatever you're famous for or whatever your nickname is, make sure it doesn't rhyme with anything derogatory because it will be used against you one day, right? <laughs> yeah. All right, let's talk about. I feel like we need to talk about the winners, the actual winners of the event, uh, and how different they are. Um, I don't know if either of you guys are particularly passionate on one or the other. If you want to kind of lead the discussion on on either of them, um, I feel like. Well, I think let's just start with Alberto. He won first. Uh, so Alberto Hines Lopez just f falls ass backwards through the Olympic final onto the, the gold medal spot on the podium. I don't know what else to say. Like, I mean, a couple of weeks ago, we were talking about how it was a huge mistake that he went to every competition this season, including all the youth comps. And he looks so tired and the guy just like the strategy just didn't work out. Comes out in finals, so what happens? In in speed climbing, I guess Alberto's a speed specialist now, according to the broadcasters. But So race number one, he competes against Colin Duffy. Colin Duffy, Duffy absolutely favored, any false starts. Alberto moves on to the next race uh, uh, in the lead. Second race, he gets to race against Adam Andra instead of Basamawem, because Basamawem 
if he hadn't been injured, would have absolutely shredded Adam Andra. And so now you're facing one of the world's best speed climbers. Instead, he gets to face Adam Andra and wins the thing in a good race. And then race three in for racing for first place up against Tomoa and, of course, slips on his namesake move just absolutely falling apart and Alberta puts in a good time and manages to come away first place in speed. You're just like, I, I'm not sure what the perfect speed comp is. It's either when everybody does it perfectly and every race is good, or if somebody just takes the deck of cards and sprays them in the air and you're just like, well, fuck it. Like, welcome to speed, everybody. But I, on, I've, I've uh, got to say, I don't know if you saw it, but on the Olympics Instagram, they um, in their stories, they had your first ever Olympic sport climbing champion master of the speed discipline <laughs> of Bernardino Lopez of Spain and, and I, I'm in a group of some of the speed climbers and uh, they were just gnawing their arms off they were so like you've got to be kidding like they've worked <sighs> years for the acclaim that they get as being all these you know, climbers the like on earth reluctantly taking up speed and then they just walk away with the mantle of master of speed that's so like oh that's gotta sting man that's gotta sting yeah but interestingly, as an Alberto fan, suddenly you're thinking, holy shit, man, if this kid can get first place in speed, which is absolutely not his specialty, if he does okay in bouldering and then does as well as he can in lead, like he's actually going to win this thing. Now, bouldering goes like approximately as expected. He doesn't top anything. Um, it was a hard round, but he came dead last, which in this case was seventh, not eighth, which may have been an advantage as well, because uh, that would have put him behind some other climbers if, if Basa had been there possibly. Um, and then elite climbing, he has a good climb. It's not the perfect climb, but he, he does what he's supposed to do ends and forth. And the way the math works out, he, uh, he is your new Olympic gold medalist. Um, what's there to say about Alberto Ginez Lopez? I don't really know. You know, he's never won a world cup. He came second in the overall in 2019, which I'm pretty sure was his debut season. So we think of him as a lead climber. I'm obviously, I've, said before i'm a huge fan which makes me feel so dumb for absolutely <laughs> wrecking him right before the olympics um but you know it's obviously not the person that anybody expected i think i had him in my top eight prediction but not as a favorite to win at all um i, I don't know what to think like what do you guys have any anything to say about this john <laughs> <laughs> I'm still trying to kind of wrap my head around it. Let me, let me just kind of, let me you're, kind of. You're in as much shock as Alberto yeah, is. Yeah, which I've had this, this same exact conversation with so many people and it's, everybody's kind of in the same boat and I don't know if that's, I don't know if that's good or bad. I, I mean, I don't know if that reflects positively or negatively on, on how the Olympics, you know, ended up uh, the outcome. I think it's important to make this distinction that we, we need to talk critically about his, victory in terms of everything context it makes scoring. him the best climber in the well, world john that's the only to... context you need to know he is the I... best rock climber you, in you, the world. you gotta remember now he is in the category of goat <laughs> yeah you, you exactly He's a little the goat. Goat well, that's, next to him. that's my point I, I think we need to, it's important to like sort of hold two thoughts at the same time we we want to acknowledge that he he earned it he deserves it he played by the rules bravo you know, we don't but we don't want to take anything away from his victory. But at the same time, I think it's really interesting to dissect his victory uh, and, and maybe be critical of it in some ways. So I think it, it's important to say that we, we can pick this apart without kind of knocking the guy, if that makes sense, um, because I think it was really exciting for him. I know his home country, Spain, is ecstatic and rightly so. I come away from his victory with a real lack of closure to be honest because <laughs> you look at alberto you need therapy is, after this win dude three people there's three different ways you kind of you kind of look at him right there if you're if you're a fan of his particularly maybe if you're in his his home country whatnot tyler you're about as big of a fan of his as i know so it's like if you're a fan of his you come away from his olympic gold saying like uh, yeah totally right if you're not a fan of his but you you follow the World Cup circuit. I'm mean, not 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 a fan of his. That's not yeah. that's not it. But if you just follow, if the you World don't have Cup pictures circuit, on your ceiling like I do, then like yeah, you, yeah, you yeah. come away from it being like, huh, uh, okay. Like if you follow him on the Cup circuit, you're like, yeah, he's a crusher. Okay, he gets. If you don't, if you don't follow the comp circuit at all, you come away from it and you're just like, what? Who is this guy? Right? Um, and I think that that plays into this lack of closure. I think at the I was trying to 
I'm, I've just been trying to like pan out. So I've been thinking like, okay, what do we want sports to do? What do we want the Olympics to do? We the the reason we love sports is because they give really simple and definitive answers to these really complex, nebulous questions like who is the greatest, who is the best, what does it mean to win, what does it mean to persevere, all these things. It's like, well, let's meet on August fifth and like we'll have a comp and we'll decide. We'll answer all those questions. It's easy to do when you look at somebody like Yanya winning. All those are, okay, yes, all those are answered. Somebody like Alberto wins, and you're like, mm, I feel like none of those questions have been answered. <laughs> like, uh, it, I think, I, 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 I feel like, I feel like you have a, like, there, everybody has a, a special regard for the Olympics, which I think is fair, as much as I think a lot of us also have a lot of disdain for something like the Olympics. The fact that there are so many eyes on it, it is a huge platform for athletes. It's a celebrated event. It ostensibly is supposed to be an apolitical celebration of humanity, you know, across borders, you know, whatever. Um, so something about it is we want it to be the pinnacle of sports because it is the pinnacle of, of um, uh, like, it's the ultimate audience for any athlete. Like, that's 100% true. But I think for a lot of sports and climbing by like way more than most other sports is in a situation, not just because of the format, but also, you know, because of the, the COVID situation and the fact that, you know, climbing is one of those sports where it's best to have a lot of events in a year. Like winning this thing does not make you the best climber, let alone a better climber than the person that came second to you or third to you. And, and I think people need to really understand that, that none of us really measure your worth as a climber based on the combined format. This was an exhibition tournament and it was the, the most highly rewarded exhibition tournament you'll probably ever get in climbing. But I think we do need to draw the line. Like when people start talking any bigger than that, even for Yanya, like, because when we talk about Yanya, we're talking about her with all the other context, right? It's not the Olympics that made her great, although obviously it was an excellent effort we can talk about. But, you know, the Olympics is a single story. They got to work towards it for two years, which is unique and fascinating. And so I'm happy to say that, yeah, these guys put in a marathon effort over like 700 days to make this work. Good job. But I, I don't want to read more into it. I don't want, like, I'm not going to use this to judge Alberto's worth as a climber, frankly. Like, the it was a crapshoot, man. Like, a sing, I'm not going to define who you are by a single route and three boulders. And, a, like, that speed tournament to even decide how good a speed climber you are, like, where, I don't, I don't know, man. Like, it's, it's, I'm not willing to even engage a discussion where, where we're trying to, like, determine if this makes climbers worth more or less because i i really think you know as much as i'm glad i think it was a good tournament it means very little in terms of judging how good you are i was just looking um and i'm failing miserably to find the old digital copy of uh the first issue of the circuit i did because i interviewed jackie Godoff about the history of competitions the origin of competitions and something he said uh, rings incredibly true which is no climbing competition will find the best climber in the world what it will find is the best climber in that competition on that day and therefore you go well we've taken the worst climbers in the world and put them there so by deductive reasoning duh, duh, duh. but it's not the case it's on that set on that day it was Alberto's competition um, can't be taken away from him, but we all have to sit back and acknowledge, wow, what a weird final, mm -hmm. you know, I, straight away. The fact that there was no contingency plan for injury. So when Bassa went out, how did that affect the seed that straight away skewed finals incredibly? I mean, realistically, it should have been the top qualifier that got the buy, not the last. Because if you've done the least to deserve your place in speed and then you're guaranteed a minimum of fourth, yeah, that, you know, that just goes against. So it should have been, realistically, it should have been Tomoa getting the first round skip as the top qualifier. Oh, yeah, as the yes, top qualifier that, that was case, left. Yeah. yeah. Um, so that whole thing was, you know, un unplanned for and because of it it meant that the two fastest men that were left in speed 
ended up running off in the semi-final, not in the big final. Um, and so, you know, the whole thing, then you had a bouldering event, which was a one boulder problem event. Um, so the boulderers didn't get to show their stuff. So it was basically, like you said, it was a crapshoot, just a complete. And, you know, that doesn't take away from Alberto because he got it done. But don't pretend it's anything it's not. Yeah. It, it sounds like it's I mean, we're kind of all in agreement here. We're kind of all like, yeah, good for Alberto. But like, yeah, it's kind of weird, right? I, I think, Eddie, you're kind of uh, touching on, you're getting close to talking about, I mean, uh, the thing that played into it as well in terms of all the, the Andra's um, kind of automatic birth and speed and, and all that is the multiplied scoring. Something that somebody said online, I mean, meaning another thing that we can discuss and kind of be critical of another thing that somebody said online was you look at this is their words not mine but they said you look at alberto he wins one event and he's mediocre at the other two which is like i mean honestly he got last in bouldering uh, out of the participants right S seventh out of seven participants so saying he's mediocre is 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 kind of nice and i think saying he's mediocre in lead is a little it, it, like i think he did a little better than mediocre but point taken he wins one event, he does mediocre in the other two, and yet he's deemed the, the gold medalist. It, it, it's, to me, when I think of what is the combined discipline supposed to do in theory, right? How we get there is still a work in progress, I think. But in theory, it's supposed to find the best all-around climber at these three disciplines. And you look at Alberto's results, and you're, you're like, first, and then mediocre, mediocre. Like, I don't, it's hard to say he's kind of, he fits that theoretical mold of what, of what the combined is supposed to do. And then I, we don't have to get into all the mad scientist formulations of alternatives. You can add the scores instead of multiplying. Somebody said, Hey, if you, if you look at who got in the top five of all three disciplines, that was Colin Duffy. So Colin Duffy, you know, kind of, <laughs> these people is, really want Colin Duffy is, to win this event. Holy well, shit. Well, But if you think like, <laughs> if, if the point is to find the best all around climber, I want to, I want to top five. I want to argue with that though. I have to, yeah, because please. they, you know, for the IFSC acknowledged at the start, like we need to give speed climbers a chance. Like we can't take this discipline where they specialize in one, but don't climb the other two. Like if, if we start things off with like a veil of ignorance or whatever, where we have, uh, you know, just a set of the world's best climbers. And some of them, if if they had known that the Olympics were going to happen in a combined thing, maybe they would have done, you know, more more disciplines. But if we wanted to showcase all of them well, we need to make sure that speed climbers get a chance to be in the finals. And by picking the multiplication, it meant that whoever came first in speed was pretty much guaranteed to go to finals and stood a chance at having a podium, which is really important to make sure all of the disciplines are represented. Now, when they came up with that, Alberto Hines Lopez was not the speed climber that they had in mind but i i you have to push back because the plan wasn't to necessarily be to find the, the best you know overall climber in the sense of whoever's most consistent across all of them it was built to be this way so that coming number one was a huge deal and unfortunately this was the scenario where everybody else was kind of like alternating back and forth enough we didn't have that andre dominance or that like yanya dominance where it was like five one one none of the guys managed to pull that off so guess what this is what happened so i do take issue with the idea that somebody coming like 444 is supposed to be better than someone coming 188. That wasn't their plan. They acknowledged that and that's what they chose. So I, that might be what, you know, some of these people on the internet want, but the IFSC decided that that wasn't the priority. Yeah, I'm not in love with it either necessarily. I, I think my thinking is I don't know if multiplied is the best. I don't know if anybody has thought of a better system yet. I, I'm kind of just, I still have questions. That's kind of sure. what I'm what I'm saying. Well, the great thing is you don't have to worry about them because it's, all over, thank it's just been taken out the back and shot and it's been used <laughs> for glue. Well, which is funny because I actually like the three event combined discipline. The, I, I like the idea of putting them all together. I just don't know if the multiplied scoring is the best. I don't know if, I, I like I said, I don't have a better alternative necessarily, but... Um, I don't know. Whenever we Look, all get to I, meet up, we'll have a John Memo uh, John Bergman Memorial combined event, and it'll just be the three of us across three disciplines and try and try and climb anything. <laughs> it, it was just a surreal, basically, series of events. 
you know, they could never have anticipated when they set it up that the speed climber wouldn't make speed. Mm -hmm. And that the second fastest speed climber would fall off. Yep. And at the end of the day, it was about as unpredictable as if only speed climbers had made the lead final. Yeah. I want to I wanna ask uh, what you guys think this will mean for Alberto because Yanya is in a very different situation, a, a very different class of athlete on the, on the world stage, at least particularly in climbing. Um, he's only 18. He's, you know, he's made some World Cup podiums. He's already a climbing star within the climbing world of Spain. I imagine that profile will explode. I think uh, – uh, uh, one of our uh, uh, viewers in Spain mentioned that there are only three Spanish gold medals, I think, at this games. And of course, he's one of them, which is a huge deal. I, I think it was similar in Slovenia for Yanya, but his profile is going to go through the roof. He's a young guy. I, I'm very, I have basically no predictions, but I'm very curious to see how this plays out for him because I feel like he's about to be presented with a lot of trappings of success. And I'm curious how that reflects on him or how, how that will um, affect him. Uh, as an athlete in in the early stages of his career right like will this put a lot of pressure on him that he has trouble dealing with will this make him realize that he can be successful if given you know the one in a million set of criteria i don't know do you guys have any uh any any thoughts or wisdom yeah i've got a bit i think the first thing we'll stop saying is that guinness lopez is going to train with andra we'll start saying that andra is going to train with guinness lopez um because you know you've got to take credit where credit's due obviously um, adam's adam's gonna unfollow you on instagram man after that that's, that's... <laughs> no um i honestly i think it'll be huge for him for a very long time but I also think because he's such a level-headed young guy, um, he will be relatively unaffected. And I, I think there are people, let's say there are people within the sport a win would have been worse for sure. in terms of messing with their mental health, personal expectations and stuff going forth. I think Guinness Lopez um, is well-rounded enough that he'll be able to absorb that it was kind of a lucky win and he's not going to go up there and throw his toys out of the pram if he doesn't win every World Cup for the next two years. Um, whereas, yeah, there's some climbers that kind of had the weight of expectation on them and maybe winning a World Cup would have been worse for them. Um, so I think... You know, as as well as I know him, he's always been a super humble kid. I think you saw that when he just couldn't believe he'd won. And, you know, I remember talking to him at Moscow U4 Champs and several other times when whenever he does well, he's kind of overwhelmed because he knows he's worked so hard, but he, then he surprises himself of his achievement. Um, and I think I think he's a great ambassador for, for the sport. I'm actually super pleased that it goes to someone young because he's also going to be around for the next decade. You know, if, if it went to Andra, um, and again, not saying this to pick on Adam, but if it went to Andra or if it went to um, Jakob or if it went to Sean McCall and they said, we've won it, we've done the pinnacle, that's us done for comps, we retire. That would be worse for competition climbing than having a young winner who will be visible. <clears throat> You know, if, if they had won and rode off into the sunset with a gold medal never to be seen in the comp scene again would have been sad. And I'm not saying that's what would have happened to any of those three, but I'm saying, you know, if it was someone who's pushing 30 and... It would have ended a story think, rather than kind of starting one, I guess, is uh, is a fair point. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah I, and, I, and I, we so already have our storyline for Paris 2024 lead up, which is people trying to <laughs> Alberto trying to potentially qualify. trying to, defend, to qualify. And then if he does, then defend his his uh, gold medal, albeit in different like a slightly different format. But other people then trying to overtake the reigning gold medalist. So that's that's great. It's already painted for us that narrative. Uh, and and we'll see. So. Just, just to end it on Alberto, like my nightmare for a gold medal was Colin Duffy expressionlessly 
like taking taking the gold. I had no idea that a young Spanish kid could outdo Colin Duffy at showing blank emotion after winning a gold medal. Just him that that one brief shot. I know on the podium he was much better, but that that moment on the couch when he's just trying to absorb what happened and Adam is just sitting there just like you could just see the life draining from from behind Adam's eyes. It's just like, man, how do you outdo Colin Duffy at, at having no response to the biggest thing that's ever going to happen to you in your life? I wouldn't have on that that was pretty nuts i i think it was just pure shock i think sure, it was yeah. literally that he was just you know he was in a strong state of disbelief he didn't want to react and then wake up and discover he was dreaming yeah yeah i think i we're gonna i'm sure we'll talk more about the broadcast and the camera work in the future but the the first of all that catching that moment where where nathaniel is shaking alberto to kind of let him know he won while adam's sitting in the back realizing he has to like move over <laughs> off the podium couch but the sequence where the camera is looking at Jakob, pans to Jakob's coaches as they hold up you know the the big three and then Jakob just turning his face into the camera it was it was just like you you know it's pretty rare you managed to catch that sequence with a single camera and show it live that was uh unreal it was a great moment uh all right let's talk about yanya as our as our other big winner um uh probably a bigger favorite than adam or tomoa just given how incredibly dominant she's been in both bouldering and lead in the last uh in the last couple of years uh first in bouldering first in lead fifth in speed which is pretty good uh and uh yeah just you know had it locked midway through the lead climb um i mean fifth in speed with that catch when she was racing was it brooke and she just like one hand like feet blow off just catches (laughs) it saves it and still goes on to win like you you talk about olympic moments that right there even though Mm -hmm. it didn't end up meaning anything because she had such a big lead from the other two events it showed she was not willing to to let anything slide 100 percent. yeah what does this mean for yanya garnbrett I mean, she's already a superstar beyond just climbing in Slovenia. And we we sometimes forget that. She's two-time sportswoman of the year already in that country. Um, I would say she's locked in for a third. She was the flag bearer at the closing ceremony. Now, unlike a World Cup where carrying the flag into the venue is kind of like a job no one wants to do. Yeah, it's Being for a the flag new bearer kid on the, the team. Year, yeah. It's for the new kid on the team. Being a flag bearer at the Olympics for your nation is a huge deal. That mm-hmm. That is a a very important accolade from your NOC. Um, I think, you know, with hope, I'm, it, it's hard for me to say just how much this means because she she didn't have to answer the question but answering the question was that much more fulfilling seeing that we didn't see the answer the question answered in the guys mm-hmm. yeah i think she made it just that much harder for anybody else to ever match her legacy right because think about let's go through some of her accolades here you know she's won a bouldering season world cup season right she's won a a lead world cup season she's won a multiple uh bouldering world championships right multiple lead world championships some of some of which i think bouldering maybe has in consecutive years right uh i'm doing this off the top of my head so help me if i'm she's won the combined world champ multiple combined world champion So it's like now, even if someday there's some competitor that does all of that, which is impossible for us to even imagine someone duplicating that. But even if somebody does all that, it's like, well, but to be as good as Yanya, they got to win a gold medal as well. Right. So it's like Yanya just keeps she keeps adding these accolades that is further distancing from her, not only from the pack that is currently competing, but from just the true greats that are going to follow in her footsteps. She's just even distancing herself from all of them. Um, it's it's, it's kind of like, I think in tennis, you know, you can have Grand Slam, you can have somebody that wins all the tournaments, but then it's like, well, but they did they do it all in the same season, right? Well, no, it's like these, these little th- 
bits of separation. And so this this Olympic gold for Yanya is just another thing that separates her from the rest, separates her into that that echelon where she's going to be probably untouchable. I, I I really it is. I mean, I don't you don't want to say nobody else because obviously like sports go on forever. Who knows? But I cannot envision anybody coming along, especially as the competition presumably gets steeper and steeper and the competitors get better and better. The training gets better and better. I cannot imagine anybody accomplishing all that she has accomplished. And she's still going, right? She's still on the World Cup circuit. So, I mean, and that's the thing. We, you, you kind of closed it with the right thing there. And she's still going. Now, let's put that into perspective. So she is equal with Jane Kim on the most World Cup victories ever at 30. So next time she wins the World Cup, she becomes the most successful World Cup climber ever. You close out your statement with, and she's still going, and she's just over a year older than Natalia. And we're talking about Natalia just coming. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, yeah. I mean, you talk about Natalia being this great hope and phenomenal climber, which she absolutely is. But by the time Yanya was Natalia's age, she had already done so, so, so much. And we forget that because Yanya has been around since, you know, she was very young, that she's only 22. Mm -hmm. if, she, if she competes to the age where Akio is, she's at three, she's at what? She's got she's 10 more years LA. to go, man. Yeah, she's got LA Olympics, she's got um, Paris Olympics, who knows, maybe she signs off at the Brisbane Olympics. Mm-hmm. I mean, oh, did they get it, it, it for for thirty two? Yeah. Oh, okay, I didn't see that. Yeah. So I mean, you know, can you imagine like being that young with that many accolades and the one thing missing from the trophy shelf was the Olympic gold medal, and it wasn't something that everyone had one of because there had never been one. So, to be, you know, she's the first Olympic gold medalist. She has a 100% win rate of Olympic gold medal. <laughs> I mean, you know, I, I, I know you guys are a little bit opposed to this, but I'm going to go out there and say she's probably the greatest of all time. Um, she, she keeps adding more accolades to make her a stronger case for that, right? It, at, at some point, it gets hard to kind of argue the contrary. Um, if she keeps moving the goalposts further and further away, and the thing is, over the next few years, we're going to see the ascendancy of climbers like Shay and So, like uh, some of the young Japanese climbers like Natalia Grossman, Aria and Baterni, things like that, who are fantastic climbers. And it's not going to be all one-way traffic, but that's not going to diminish what Yanya's already achieved. Even if she has a couple of years in the wilderness, she's still done. Yeah, it's, it's like Michaela Schifrin in skiing or Lindsay Vaughn or any of those iconic athletes. They have the doldrums, but once you've once your legacy's there, yeah. She, and and Yanya, and Yanya, let's be clear, all those people that you mentioned, Cheon So, uh, uh, Orion Bertone, they're growing up watching Yanya. So no matter how great they become, you always are going to have to say, well, there wouldn't be a Che Yun So or who or or Orion or whoever turns out to be the next phenomenal uh, person on the circuit. There wouldn't be this person if it wasn't for Yanya. What she, you know, it's the old music. There wouldn't be the Beatles if there wasn't Chuck Berry, and there wouldn't be. Right? It's the old like music argument, um, and that just adds to her legacy as well. And that was also something that we didn't cover enough is the fact that she got to stand on the podium at the Olympics with her hero. Yep. You know, yep. Akio, Yanya's always been open that Akio is her climbing hero, and what a great way for Akio to go out yeah, with and the I, person that idolizes her on the top step. Yeah, and it's just wonderful. I mean, I don't know if we stress this enough. As all of us are members of the media, it's just so, it's such a joy to be covering the sport, doing this show, writing articles, taking photographs, whatever it is. It's just wonderful to be covering this sport at a time when Yanya is is in it, right? I mean, that, there's a there are going to be plenty of reporters, past and present, that don't have that that fortune. And so um, 
it's just a real joy. Yeah. Do you think Tyler's still alive? I'm He's still kind of here. Frozen. I'm still oh, here. Oh, you're still there. Yeah, don't worry. I, I thought you, you guys were making no, you guys were making excellent arguments. I didn't want to like get in the way. Yeah, I appreciate you guys carrying that. No, I'm thinking really hard about like you know my because I just talking. About, I'm, we're not going to derail on this. We can talk about this later. But about Yanya's about Yanya's greatness because I I I think she is she could be the goat right now. If not, she'll probably be the goat soon. The the one thing I think about is like all things relative to time, knowing that, you know, in general, a boulder today is probably stronger and a better boulder than a boulder from 20 years ago. I think that's a fair bias because I, I do think the sport evolves and, and gets better. I'm not a hundred percent. If you, if you take that factor out, I think Yanya, like, I'm not, sh- I'm not willing to call Yanya the best lead competitor ever. And I'm not willing to call her the best boulder competitor ever yet. I think she probably will, just knowing where she is in her career. And so that might be an argument by itself. But the more I judge somebody's greatness on like multiple different disciplines, it starts to become cloudier. Um, you know, calling Adam Andra the greatest rock climber of all time is, you know, that's a hard argument to make because we're talking like he's, he's been a competitor, he's been an outdoor climber and he's got incredible accomplishments in all of them. But to say he's the best boulder competitor ever, or the best lead competitor ever, those are somewhat content, not, I don't want to say super contentious, but it's, it's arguable. Um, You can argue the other way. And that's something I just want to be cautious about with Yanya is, is the greatest of all time, of what of just like competition climbing in general because if it the more yeah. vague it gets the the more you kind of have to present really good arguments for it and and i'm i'm not talking about necessarily anybody here but to, i do just bring back what i said to, to to call somebody the goat and then to make the reason she swept a boulder season like that's a very cool achievement she's the only person that has swept the boulder season but we all know she's not the person who has won the most bouldering world cups in one season and if that's your only argument and you can't tell me like you know like i said who the second best is which i think a lot of people who just you know offhand mention that she's the goat probably don't have an argument who's second or who's third i think that's something like that is such a i want that title to mean a lot and i'm just really worried that I don't have my thoughts fully formed around it. And that I think a lot of the people prescribing that title probably haven't fully thought it through and, and kind of compiled them, uh, their opinions completely to really give like, there's no, there's no higher title in sports, right? I think you should have to explain yourself when you make an argument like that. So that's just my, my, my final opinion on, on the goat thing. Um, I think I do think she will become the greatest female uh, competitor or possibly for, for both genders of all time. But uh, I'm just, I, I still need some time to, to, to let it percolate, I guess. But yeah. I, I don't fully disagree, Tyler. I, I mean, I don't love, it's not that I don't think Yanya is the greatest. I just, in uh, sort of in principle, I don't love the idea of giving that title to somebody while they are, while they are still uh, kind of creating their legacy, I guess. Like while they're still active, I, I think the goat. I almost tend to think the goat designation should have a little bit of reflection to it, um, a little bit of distance, because I think it's very easy to also get caught up in the hype, right? That just the hype and the buzz and the fandom, and it's easy to kind of just have that um, kind of trump a little bit of statistics. And I think the goat argument should always, to a certain extent, go back to statistics. So Tyler, I, I don't think you're way off base. I, I just think. Um, I, I, I just think that the more Yanya does, the more she makes it harder f- for you anyone know. else to become the goat. Sure, oh, totally. Exactly. Yeah. I want to, and, and we're going to move on from this because we need to talk about the Olympics. <laughs> There's more to talk about. But the, the counterpoint to the statistics thing, and this is really important, and this is one of the things that really catches me up, is that the counterpoint to the statistics is the eye test. Look at them compete. Are they just clearly better, even if it doesn't necessarily show in the statistics, right? The person coming second place to Yanya today, you know, may be far better or far worse than the person coming second to Sandrine LeVay like 20 years ago, right? Like there, there can be discrepancies. And here's the problem with climbing. I've never seen a full video of Sandrine LeVay competing in a Boulder World Cup. 
So I know she was a fucking banging boulder and like won a bunch of events. And I know that Angie Eider had a, like a dominant couple seasons, absolutely shredding the circuit. But I've never watched any of those comps because I don't have access to them right now. Apparently, there are people that have them and I and I could possibly watch them. But like, guess what? Our concept of like climbing history, especially for people that are, you know, you know, fairly casual viewers, they don't have a full understanding of this stuff. Nobody's made a documentary on these people that are the, you know, potential second places or the potential greatest of all time. So most of what everybody's talking about is statistics. Most of what I'm talking about is statistics. And the part that's missing is the eye test. And that's what really scares me is I don't think a lot of people actually know who they're comparing Yanya against, which means that the the analysis is frankly really hollow until people have that that good balance. That's kind of the the end of my <laughs> the end of my non Olympic rant. Um, so I, I, I'm I'm going to take it back to the Olympics here and just right. say how much did she absolutely own the field on the boulders? It's a great example that, of the eye that test. That to me was the biggest exclamation mark. And, you know, she didn't even have to come out and do the third boulder. And in the end, she didn't get it. But she absolutely wombled up to the zone on that third one, which I think only one or two people had even got to while making it look desperate. Yeah. And she just, as much as talking about the bouldering is something we'll do later. Oh, yeah. She gave... Yeah, it's hard to explain the separation that there was there. Well, let's just say, like, we'll we'll talk about the bouldering later, but the bouldering rounds were largely shit through this entire competition. But watching every woman fail every single boulder, and then to watch Yanya Garmbret, well, not flash all of them, but but just dominate through them, just was yeah. a just like uh, magnified the difference between these athletes. I mean, I, I saw comments from people who weren't climbers who were going, what's wrong with the other girls if they can't do it at all? And that last <laughs> girl just did it so easy. Like, yeah. pe people working within the networks and stuff sending messages who weren't climbers but were involved in the production side going, is there something wrong with the other girls? How come that girl is so much better? Like, yeah. to a non-climber, it looked like a different sport almost. Yeah, no kidding. Okay. That plays into the 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 discussion about greatest of all time too. I mean, not to bring it back to that, I but but it's it's not just being good. It's being it's separating yourself from the rest of the field, like being so much better than the than everybody else. I mean, that is true greatness, right? When when you are when you are running a race and, and you're not only winning, but you're making everybody else look like they are walking the race. It's, it's just, that is, I think that if, if you want to talk Tyler about, about kind of intangibles beyond the results, beyond just wins and losses, the things that you use to measure greatest of all time, this is one of those intangible metrics. It's, it's okay, but how far ahead of their, their peers were they? Um, right. It's, it's like, yeah, Jordan plays basketball. There's a lot of great, there's magic Johnson, Larry bird, right. Hakeem Olajuwon, but it's like, but Jordan's skill was so far removed from the others. I mean, as much as, you know, I'm a huge Larry bird fan being from Indiana, but uh, that's beside <laughs> the point. Uh, you take my point. It's like, she's Yanya is just so much better than, uh, then the other people in the Olympics, I think we can say on the World Cup circuit, there are people in lead that are maybe kind of on her level with Chan. So uh, in bouldering this season with Natalia Grossman and stuff. But in the Olympics, it was just clear that Yanya was she, she just had like the boss mode in a video game or something, you know, where it's just like so much better. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it's like she has all the assists switched on yeah. because yeah. she's just like duh, 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 duh. and you know, you're watching incredibly competent boulderers just flail, not just in finals, but in qualifying as well. And she just comes out and she comprehends better. But the thing that I love most about watching her compete is that she just wants to climb. You know, I, I said it before, I said it again, the third boulder in women's finals, she already knew she had won, she had the one for bouldering. 
she could have saved the energy for lead and not even pulled onto that boulder. Mm -hmm. But she walked out there, looked up and went, the root set has made that for me to get up. (laughs) I'm going to try and get up it. And that to me is like, what a champion mindset. Let's uh let's end the winning discussion on that and uh let's talk about the losers from this event which is always the best part especially when Eddie's on the show hell yeah let's tear some kids up um I I'm going to go first uh just because I think you guys went first on some of the other stuff um just to start the discussion on an athlete perspective and I'm sure we'll dig into the nitty gritty production shit later on the like the the big question for me was like it was hard to dis- determine whether Tomoe Narasaki or Adam Andra was the favorite to win. Um, both of them had different reasons. Tomoe was on on home soil. He's been a, a relatively more recent development. He's been a dynamic force in bouldering, but also putting his mark on speed climbing. Whereas Adam Andra has been competing for you know basically ten years, and he's put up some of the hardest outdoor climbs on the planet. Um, and gets the title of greatest rock climber in history every once in a while. Um, I personally leaned into Adam Andra being the favorite for this event uh, because of that kind of hype, because he's already a big name, because he was getting the backing of people like, uh, you know, Alex Honnold. Um, he he was being built up, and, and I think that's fair. Um, I was also thinking back to Akio at, I can't remember what World Cup that was, maybe 2016, where the pressure of just a Japanese Boulder World Cup was just like too much to handle. And I was really nervous about that for Tomoa. But so I, I'm going to say the biggest loser from this event for me was Adam Andra. He had the most expectation. The second he, well, even before he qualified, he had his camera crew running around filming a two year long documentary series on his road to Tokyo. Um, and as much as he had this high point in speed, which maybe just says don't celebrate too early, um, I think this was his event to lose. This, just like we said with Yanya, adding an Olympic gold medal makes it a lot harder to argue whether you're the best or not. Um, for me, he was the the one that uh, uh, that lost the most from it. I'm excited to see if this motivates him to get to a next level because that would be a sight to see. But uh, for me, my big loser is Adam Andra. I, I, I agree. I mean, I mean, I, I just your heart breaks for him, right? Because it's not his fault that he that all these expectations were there. I mean, it's like all he did is just be a, a phenomenal climber, right? He, <laughs> he all he did is establish this career where he's so incredibly good. And the result of that is that everybody expects him to just be the best and to and to win everything. So it's like he didn't do anything except for just have this incredible foundation of a career going into this and and didn't go his way um i i don't have a lot to add i just feel really bad for him because he i think he said in his instagram something like yeah I, you know you trained two years for this you lost a, a lot of time that you could have been climbing outdoors which we know that's what he loves to do um just i, I feel sad for all the competitors in different ways that didn't get on the podium but uh andre's definitely one that yeah, bummer for him. Eddie, do you have any uh, any Adam comments? <laughs> Not really, because I, I think I've already said earlier um, sure. that I didn't think his media team painted the results in a good light. That was unfortunate. But in general, uh, I don't think I would say anything negative about any of the climbers, purely because I put all the climbers in the winner's category um as individuals um whether some people overperformed or underperformed to me doesn't in this instance necessarily make them a loser because they're dealing with pressure at a scale that they've never had to manage before you know i've seen a lot of climbing comps obviously through my job um and to be honest, when, for instance, Julia Kaplina cried after falling off the speed route, that was understandable because she knew that was her Olympics over. When you had someone like Laura Rigora crying after the first boulder, that just showed the pressure because there was three more boulders even, plus the lead route. But you could see the pressure was already eating them to a degree which I've never seen in a World Cup and how they handled that they had no reference point going in they've never had to handle that before so you know 
That's my take on the athletes. That's why it was impossible to create to make predictions for this. It's impossible to make predictions for any competition, of course, but I kept saying going into this, whenever people would ask me my favorites and all this, I would say there is no way of anybody to be confident in any of their predictions, even for even for Yanya, right? Like, I mean, as much as we thought she would do well, it's she's never faced any pressure that is comparable to the Olympics. Like, there's no there's no blueprint. Nobody has any experience with dealing of a competition of this magnitude. There was just no way for them to to know what this was going to be like, and you you just didn't know who was going to do well in it, who was going to buckle under the pressure, who was going to make a mistake and then maybe have that mistake just compound mentally into into kind of everything spiraling out of control. Just, yeah, well said, Eddie. It's just you, the the Olympics are just this whole other this whole other thing. John, what about you? What do you have for uh, for your base loser? You know, I'm looking at my list here. I had a lot of things written down. I feel like we've already touched on them, to be honest. I, I the main thing that I wrote was I, I just I don't know who would be the loser here, but I didn't like the idea of Andra getting that automatic berth into uh, the next round of speed. Now, I think it it was kind of a, a bullet was dodged there a little bit because the fact that Andra didn't end up making the podium uh, it was kind of easy to forget about that little that little uh, smooth kind of automatic transition for him into that round. I think if he had made a podium and you could look back on on the architecture of how that podium place was created and cite that automatic advancement, I think that could have been a real PR mess for because it it was already a mess. People were already upset about it, but it all ended up being kind of a moot point. But I think it could have been a lot worse there. Um, so that was on my loser list. I also just, Tyler, you already said this, but I think it's worth reiterating that the the boulders really seemed either overcooked or undercooked, depending on which boulder we're talking about. It did not feel like maybe a, maybe like a couple times in the men's, maybe a little bit in the qualification rounds, but for the most part, it didn't feel like we ever found that sweet spot of tops and separation. And, and it, it, it's just, which is a little ironic, right? Because we've been talking this World Cup season how the setting has been phenomenal. A lot of times they've hit that separation perfectly. I I had ex- high expectations going into this, especially from the Innsbruck practice kind of practice setting from the World Cup. I had expectations that the boulders were going to be phenomenal. Um, I even was not, if I'm being completely honest, I wasn't even totally blown away by the lead routes. Um, I don't have anything. They weren't like bad necessarily but they're not they weren't certainly weren't the most memorable lead routes we've ever had um so i i I just thought the setting left a little bit to be desired but maybe that's a a product of my own expectations being too high look before eddie goes into this i just want to like kind of frame this in some other thoughts because eddie's about to (laughs) eddie's got like a little torture device on a drill revving up underneath his desk uh (laughs) sorry i just unplugged my headphones give me give me one second and we'll uh we'll fix this but the things i wanted to say where uh, lead and speed had great opportunities, or sorry, lead and speed, they didn't just have opportunities, they had their moments where they shone as as incredible sports. Like speed climbing was easy to digest as we knew it would be, and it had a great mix of perfect races and stunning losses, false starts, whatever. Lead climbing is given the favorite spot at the end of the comp when it all comes down to lead climbing. We had the dramatic top from Jakob in the final. We had that incredibly, like watching uh, who was the last climber, Che and So going up. And as we go, we know that the results for, for Jesse Pills was going to change. Um, getting to see Yanya rest that long on a lead climb was was super fascinating. You don't see that too often. Um, like lead climb had had this opportunity or, or, or really looked good. Bouldering did not look good coming out of this competition. I think I heard that the BBC, when they aired their coverage, they omitted the boulder round for either the men or the women. They just showed some of speed and then the lead or something like that. Like, they were long they were largely pretty boring unfortunately due to just lack of progress on a lot of these problems so if you have to say one discipline came out as the loser it is 100 percent bouldering and talking a little bit about what you just mentioned john was you know separation frankly separation wasn't really the problem in this case we didn't come out of bouldering with ties which normally is is the most important thing but we know in this event where even 
you know, even if you get the, the perfect separation and everybody climbs as they're supposed to, this event doesn't mean that much. The most important part for me was I want this sport to look fucking amazing and I want people to love watching it and then want to try it. And bouldering, not my favorite discipline to watch, but certainly my favorite to do, came out looking like a very uninteresting sport, frankly. On the men's side, seeing a one problem getting a bunch of flashes, the other one seeing barely any, if any, tops. Um, on the women's side, what, there were only two tops in finals, and they were both from Yanya after having to watch a half hour of other climbers just fall over and over. So bouldering fell apart, uh, and that was really disappointing. Yeah, I, I'm going to say I quite literally, the first thing on my list of losers, it just says bouldering. Yeah. And it was just the the men's qualifying, the OBS feed was struggling so much at that stage that we really didn't get to see if it was good or not. Just due to camera work um, decisions. And, just due to yeah. camera work, it was it was very difficult to see. I really enjoyed women's qualifying. I thought that was the one strong round of the weekend. Uh, men's finals, first problem: five of the seven climbers flash. You know, Adam does it a try or two later. Alberto doesn't do it. So that's that's a non-problem. That doesn't exist. Second problem, Nathaniel does. No one else does. Realistically, a little bit of separation, but not a thrilling boulder problem. Arguably a morpho last move. Um, definitely suited Nathaniel, which is great. Nathaniel loves those sort of committed show boulder finishes, which is why he's always killing it at US Nationals and stuff. Because if he gets to finals and they have those visually impactful boulders, he loves that style of climbing. And you saw that and you went, oh, yeah, Nathaniel's going to walk up that. And sure enough, he walked up it. And then the last boulder, which should be removed from history, um, you had seven climbers out of seven get the zone on first attempt and no one moved past it. So you had a one boulder round and it was a pretty average boulder at that. And then the woman's round, I don't know whether they set for Yanya because they felt that they had to ensure that it wasn't a flash fest and that it put her at risk. But this comes back to if you have only three boulders in a round rather than four, you don't have that margin of error boulder. You can't build in the crowd pleaser boulder, which everyone will probably do in two minutes, but at least you're going to get the highlight drill. And I think bouldering sucked, but it sucked because we didn't get enough of it. Mm -hmm. Did you? What did you think of the lead route, Eddie? Because I'm I'm trying to think. Uh, uh, like I remember, uh, Jakob's top was really exciting, but other than Jakob's okay, so top, I I disagreed with you utterly, and I actually said this to Nikki from Beta Root Setting in messages that I loved the women's lead routes, especially the men's was pretty good, but I loved the women's because from the moment they pulled on, I was watching because I didn't know when they'd fall off. They were continuously insecure and cruxy. They had a low number of heel hooks, which is where the females normally especially will get into a position where they can rest and get it all back. Um, they had insecure movements. It was, you know, Yanya was obviously pissed that she got fourth in qualifiers. She was like, what what just happened? And that was great. You know, I don't want to see people, you know, the single best thing is that it never came to time at Olympics. Um, imagine if men's podium had come down to Jakob doing it two seconds faster than... Adam, that would have been, you, you think there were some grumpy messages now, that would have been an absolute shitstorm. Um, so I think they got separation, they made the climbers insecure, you know, Adam, Pastor, Nick and team, hats off, that was one of the, the better lead rounds I've seen. The, the separation in lead was fantastic. I, I'm thinking in terms of move for move, like I'm trying to think of highlight moves in my memory i remember Jakob's top i remember the women throwing up a lot of heel hooks like you said but i don't have those like two or three iconic vivid memory movements like i have had in some other world cup rounds am i way off base here with in 
it, it comes down to perspective. I, I honestly don't think there is... I mean, there was a couple of dinos in the men's route, especially, I think, men's qualifying route, but they were very easy dinos because they didn't want to potentially drop a speed climber and the dinos tended to be quite low. Uh, I think the top route of men's qualifying had the potential to be really visual, but only Colin really and Jakob really got up there. Um, but th- with that sort of turnout pressed into the... That's true. That's true. Volume. That was neat. Yeah. Um, the woman's lead in qualifiers, I think we didn't really get to see everything it had to offer uh, because they were so gassed, but when they went through those green holds and back into the yellow... And that had the really open, slopey pinches. They were was probably a, very a bit hard too route. fatigued. But damn, it was a good route. Like from a, it was a great climbing route. Loved it. From a, was it super visually appealing? Maybe not. But then also, was it OBS still learning how to show it as best they could? I think I think it's totally reasonable for you guys to disagree because Eddie's arguing that the the function was excellent and and John's arguing that the form was subpar, which I think is completely fair. I, I agree with both of those arguments. I'm a little bit disappointed that there wasn't more in terms of beauty. I was going to say this is where Natalie's point of you know is it partially just that I was really just watching the you know what the next hold is that they have to pass you know uh, to to move up in the ranks maybe that was the problem that I remember so little of it. But I think you're right. It didn't it didn't have the same kind of beauty and adventure that some climbs just visually give off um, that we've seen, especially at some of the other events this season. So I think both of you are, are spot on with your arguments. They're just different arguments, but yeah. Um, do we, do we want to talk about men's boulder number three? Is that something that, uh, that should be um, mentioned? I think it's something that has to be in context of everything that's happened because, you know, it was something even before men's round had finished, I'd had several athletes who weren't obviously at Olympics ones watching at home started messaging me screenshots of Jay and Kim's story because she was obviously already very upset. And at the time, I hadn't picked up what it was. I think on the Discord, we were mostly discussing whether it was like some pie graph or something. Yeah, it was um, an infographic, I think people were talking about. Infographic, <laughs> yeah. And, and then the, um, the commentators dropped that it was a rising sun. And I remember hearing that and going... Oh, I didn't think they used that anymore and carrying on with life. I didn't put two and two together. I didn't think much of it at all. And then I saw Jay and Kim's comments and I I read the, I I went onto Wikipedia. I went onto a bunch of news sites where they talked about that trying to be banned prior to the Olympics because it has far right nationalist connotations. You know, obviously it's associated with the comfort girls in Korea, the rape of Nanking you know, a lot of historical atrocities. And it just became clear that it was in bad taste. Now, this is where it gets complex to me. Because it's quite possible that, like myself, the setters didn't understand the context of it. In that case, when this happens, and I truly do not understand how this hasn't been addressed, the IFSC needs to put out a press release and say it's been brought to our attention that this represented something which is culturally offensive and has been created emotional turmoil for some viewers. We're deeply apologetic about that. That wasn't our intention. Uh, We will talk to our setting teams to make sure this doesn't happen again and put policies in place to make sure that if we are doing a bold representative of something in future, all background checks are done. End of story. You put that statement out the whole thing is diffused. You take the mere culpa, you take the little deaf, and you say, yeah, you know what? We totally didn't mean to offend anyone. It was done, you know, from the right place in our heart, but the wrong the wrong finish. Mm-hmm. And no one minds. But now here we are four days later, and it still hasn't been acknowledged or recognized. And if you go into the news and read, you know, that Korean politicians are sending formal complaints to Thomas Bach about it, uh, which is, how did we shoot ourselves in the foot that badly? Mm-hmm. Why, why is this even a thing when a simple apology straight after the fact would probably have diffused the whole thing? And if that wasn't enough to diffuse the whole thing, then a more elaborate apology and saying we have contacted Getty and Associated Press to pull down images of this problem 
we have spoken to OBS, they are removing that footage from the, because let's face it, the Boulder problem didn't matter. Everyone got the same point. So you could literally cut that out of history and no one, you know, it, it could be completely diffused. And I am absolutely flummoxed that from a PR perspective, we're looking four days after the event or five days after the event and the IFSC is just, no one seems to have taken ownership within the organization. It is frustrating that without a, a, a simple, like a genuinely simple, relatively boilerplate apology, as you mentioned, without that, people start having to question whether or not, you know, this was del- like, people have to start asking, like, what was Percy Biston or Percy Bishton's involvement? What was Gen Hiroshima, uh, 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 Gen Hiroshima's involvement? Hiroshima. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, it starts like who's who's to blame in this case, where, frankly, it is almost certainly a mistake. The thing I keep coming back to in my mind is like root setters jam volumes together in whatever pattern they can figure out. And it didn't look a damn thing like the actual flag we're talking about. But if somebody just put up a circle of volumes and then they say oh that kind of looks like that thing and that comment gets over to the commentators and the commentators are like and this was supposed to look like that thing it's just a a bunch of the the simplest most oblivious human errors you could possibly imagine just you know really not not important things that you're right a simple apology could have could have just uh, eased all of this uh, really quickly. And and it is a simple response. It's frustrating that now it's down to the root setters of whether or not they intended something that is so hurtful to, to certain people in the world is, is really frustrating. Yeah. And the disappointing thing um, is so about three hours after men's finals. So probably about four and a half hours after the boulder was seen and it went online. Um, the IFSC puts out their press release and it says, um, where is it? I have it here. Um, Although all boulders reached the zone on block three, a Japanese rising stun shape. Like you, you just had four and a half hours before you put that out that you could have changed that into a chrysanthemum. Yeah. or into a uh, firework going off. Mm-hmm. A- a- and then you can deny culpability from the start but four hours after it's become an international incident you're cementing it sure and so the thing that frustrates me here isn't that it happens it's the response i don't understand how there wasn't just a mature business response of that was not what was intended we're really apologetic thank you for bringing it to our attention we've managed to educate ourselves and others about it and we will take steps to make sure it never happens again end of story Yeah, I I don't have a whole lot to add. I I I was, I'm a, I'm a, I was aware of the history of the 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 flag and the symbolism and, and whatnot. And and so as I was watching, I heard the commentator say that it's supposed to depict a rising sun. My fir- it kind of okay. I don't even want to go there. I was gonna bring. I was gonna connect sort of some of the visceral reaction to the 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 camera work and all that issue that we had earlier on the World Cup circuit, but I don't think it's fair to even draw connective tissue there. But but s- suffice to say, as it was mentioned on the broadcast, the, oh, it's depicting the rising sun. I had this reaction of like, ooh, don't say that. Like, go, like, you know, and, and, and it's like, cut to something else, right? Like, don't do that. And then it was brought up again, and I was like, oh, man, like, this is, you know, this is bad that you keep bringing this up. Then I went to type up my recap of the round, and I and I said, you know, Boulder three, supposedly depicting the rising sun, and I was like, mm, delete, delete, delete. Like I don't even want to, I don't even want to put this in there, because my hope, of course, is that hopefully the commentator said it, and that's it, and it'll die, right? It's it's over now, and and yeah, and then I got on the social media. I hadn't been on Instagram until that point. I saw Jain's post and and I was it, I just had this sinking feeling of oh no like th- it's turning into a big thing unfortunately um as I as we all kind of were knew it could when we first heard that that phrasing of what it was supposed to depict just uh I don't know unfortunate on a, a number of levels and um 
Just in case anybody else at home feels as dumb as I did. When they said the rising sun thing, the first thing I was like, was like, no, it's not. It looks like fucking shit. It's the wrong colors and the triangles (laughs) are the wrong size. And then the second thing was, I don't know anything about Japanese history. I I thought the rising sun, like, because I know that their flag is a representation from what I understand. Like their current flag is a representation of the sun, I believe, still. It doesn't have the, the, uh, the rays coming out of it. I guess that was the kind of imperial war flag from from uh back in the war and maybe other periods but i like it to me i didn't understand that that was uh just the wording was incorrect let alone that that old flag that i had seen in the past had any connotations uh to to people elsewhere i just thought it was a dead historical flag so that was this has been a a good learning experience for me just some stuff i did not know so uh yeah yeah because you you lived in korea for a while didn't you john i did yeah for five years. So, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, very, uh, I don't want to say fresh wounds. That might be the wrong phrasing, but definitely very poignant, uh, emotion. Like, you know, Jain posts that and I'm not surprised. I see that and I'm like, yeah, this is like, like, of, of course the Koreans are going to object strongly to this, not just people in Korea, but people elsewhere as well. It just, it's, it's like I said, as soon as the announcer, the commentator said it, I was like, Ooh, like, this is not good. Don't say that buddy. And then he said it again and said it, I don't know, three or four times. And it was just, uh, yeah. Yeah. And it's something I think we need to remember is that sport promotes togetherness. It promotes unity. And for instance, when I go to the World Cups overseas and I'm in Europe. Now, I've had some really interesting discussions with people in Europe because at our grand, granddad's level or people's great granddad's level, quite often they're on different sides of the firing line and they were in opposition. But here we are 75, 76 years later and we're all friends, but we all respect and acknowledge the past and because of that it's a comfortable place to be and it feels like if someone doesn't respect the past by something like the rising sun flag it makes it an uncomfortable place to be um it was interesting because i've definitely seen it around before and you know i'm just ignorant to its importance but you know it's been a learning opportunity for me and for most of us watching in the Olympics. We we come out of a bit more his, historical perspective when we went in. Um, but why on earth it hasn't been managed four or five days in, that, that's the thing. So I'm not... To me, it almost sounds bad that I don't think the rising sun boulder is as big a issue as the lack of response to the rising sun boulder. Mm-hmm. Because at what stage do you go, well, maybe they meant it to be there because no one's apologizing for it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's something small that has just become big because we couldn't acknowledge an error. If, you know, yeah. most likely an innocent error. Um, yeah, it's really yeah. too bad. All right. Um, do you guys have anything else you want to add uh, to uh, to your losers list? Anything else that was oh, yeah. notably so? All right, let's go. Um, <laughs> so my next one is the Americans. Uh, oh wait, sorry. The American press. <laughs> um, I. Um... <laughs> All right, let's go. Um, I put here that I was very disappointed in the continued continued negative clickbaity titles that were coming up in the American press in the lead up to the Olympics. I think they forget that as part of the community, the climbers are reading that media and that can be really destructive for them and it actually i don't know if you saw on my own media channels i said i'm not going to put anything up regarding speculation or opinions or anything like this because i think out of respect to the climbers we only need positive input in the run into the olympics and there was a bunch of clickbaity titles in the u.s press and also there's a bunch of americans online that i saw through various platforms that were really questioning the eligibility of their athletes to be there. And, you know, someone like, for instance, say Kyra doesn't make finals, but that probably comes down to a boulder or two boulders. And I personally thought Kyra climbed great throughout. Um, Colin doesn't make podium, but I thought 
still Clive Great throughout. But for those guys, they had to deal with a constant, what if Sean Bailey was there? What if Natalia was there? What if, and, and I thought that was, I felt sad that, okay, now in saying this, I don't speak French, so I don't know what the French media was like, but no other nation's media I saw was questioning the eligibility of their own athletes to be there and really throwing in a lot of negative what will happen if person X fails? What will happen if blah, blah, blah? It's so, yeah, that to me was the big loser that there was just like, we, we say that we're together as a sport, but if you came from the outside and looked in at that media, you'd be like, ouch, dude, these guys are like nasty. I think, I think you certainly have a, a, like a very personal perspective with a lot of the athletes because in, I, I think there's something like for yourself, not posting any, any speculation or anything like that. First of all, my platform is very different. The athletes are not giving a shit what I post if they ever see it ever. Um, but I don't think that's unfair because I, I do think in my perspective, a lot like a, a, an equal component of sport is the spectating part of it. Like if you want to be a professional athlete, that entails a lot of things. If you want to do stuff for free and not be paid for it and not go to the Olympics, then fine. You don't have to take any criticism, but I think that that, that stuff's okay. I totally understand that you have relationships with almost all of these people. Um, and I think, I think you would be hyper aware because I think you can imagine in your head or you've seen them process this stuff and of course i can't i've never seen them react to those things um the speculation about the americans about why not natalia why not sean bailey this comes up all the time and it is unfortunately it's one of those things where i hope it doesn't affect the athletes because it is a discussion based in ignorance it is people not understanding how the qualification system works and where those different athletes focus has been over the last two years like natalia grossman of course we've said this before but if she made the olympics two years ago her and Brooke could easily be switching places right now for the number of World Cup medals that they've won. Same thing for Colin and Sean. Like, I mean, if your priority is the Olympics, guess what? You don't give a shit about World Cup medals and you're training for three disciplines, not one or two. So it's, it. I would be really saddened if that's something that affects the athletes because it is obviously just people not knowing what they're talking about and that's that would really frustrate me if it was uh if it was taken as hurtful by any of them because they certainly don't deserve that and it is a it's a stupid point it's not a point at all well one one thing that sort of led to me bringing this up was actually now john you're a basketball fan right help me out here Okay, so Kevin Durant, is he one of the basketball dudes? Yes. Is that the right name? So he, he came out last night on the news and said that he felt that the amount of shit that the American basketball team had got in the lead up to the Olympics was really distracting to them. And he said that it was un-American, that they were casting so much doubt into their own team. And that made me think about the amount of stuff I'd read about the climbers and going, well, you know, I could understand climbers and personally, I think they should have, but I could understand climbers switching off them social media into the lead up to something like this. But of course, in such a disconnected game, social media is their lifeline because they don't have the normal athlete village of milling around and partying and stuff. Um, but I think, and as I said, I don't just think it's a media thing. I don't know whether it's a cultural thing or what, but it just struck me as strange that, um, yeah, it's the only country I really saw which was questioning its own picks so much. Yeah, this is I I don't even know. I mean, there's so much to unpack here. This is such a huge like you said, Eddie, it's like is this monetary, is this cultural? Is I I, I think some of this is uh, some of this is just where we are in 2021, which is this this kind of the 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 consumption of media is so ravenous. And there's so much of it that there's just this this kind of crazed drive to like, how do we get people's attention, right? It's it's almost like you have to be clickbaity in this day and age, especially now, you know, with some non-endemic outlets. Since climbing is an Olympic sport, they're publishing climbing pieces. They need to get people to look at those pieces. They have money on the line for clicks and advertising and all that. So it's like, how do we get people that are to, to I think that plays into it I think um, I also think that this is something that 
other sports, this is what other sports are founded on for better or worse. I'm not saying it's great, but this idea of just like constant speculation and whatnot. And it's, it's just a little odd because climbing, we have never really been there to that level before. Um, and, and obviously we're all pretty close to climbing. So it kind of feels weird to have it now in this new skin of like media, just all this excessive scrutiny and it's, there's just so much happening here. Yeah. I, I think you're, you're, you're right, Eddie. I I mean, it's, it's funny too, because I think that team USA was actually, we didn't, I didn't list it, but they were actually on my winner's list because I think that how they performed not only Nathaniel silver medal, but also the fact that they, they got, you know, the Kyra climbed really four well, and, and then they got three out of the four that ended up getting into the finals. It's just a nice continuation of the success that they've had, the consistent success this World Cup season. Um, but I, I think to your point about the American media, I think there is something valid there. I don't know if it's unique I guess what I'm saying is I don't know if it's unique to just like climbing. I kind of think it's just where we are culturally. I think it's where we are as as sports. I don't particularly love it. I'm not I, I don't like clickbait, but I also acknowledge as somebody in the media and as somebody who has seen articles become more clickbaity to the point now where I don't even know if clickbait is a thing. I just think it's like every article has to be that way, right? Like it's it used to be clickbait was like a catchy thing and then you click on it and you're like Oh, this doesn't seem anything like, but it's like now it's just, it's just all yeah. you got to click, you got to get the clicks now. Yeah. And uh, I mean, I let's face it, I opened the losers category with a clickbait statement <laughs> when I said the Americans, and sure. then just left a pause because that was clickbait. Because then I watched you both go, "What's he going to say about the Americans?" Which is classic <laughs> clickbait philosophy. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think. But yeah, that. Go ahead. Finish your thought. Oh, I was going to say, yeah, that 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 was my takeaway was just that the climbers, I think, have come under more scrutiny than ever before, and in some places that doesn't seem to have been appropriate. I, I yeah, the 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 two things. First of all, like uh, the clickbait that you guys mentioned, obviously people are just trying to make headlines that people haven't seen before and that seem provocative and promise some goodies inside uh, the article. Um, but like also circumstances, like how many other countries have seen superstars explode on the scene in the last couple months that aren't going to the Olympics? Like for people who just started following competitive climbing in the States, which is probably a good chunk of people, this is their first season of watching or hearing about it at least, the celebrities are Natalia Grossman and uh, and Sean Bailey, or sorry, Natalia Coleman, or whatever the joke is. Um, <laughs> you know, so I think people following this that don't have the long understanding, you know, don't understand why aren't they at the Olympics? You know, they probably weren't watching the sport when the qualifiers happened, right? Like that's so. I think it is just a lot of people having a, a bit a bit of misunderstanding about how the process works, as well as the clickbaity uh, issue. And you talk about mainstream, or like, I feel like I'm, uh, I'm, I'm like warming a crowd up for Donald Trump to come out. But you talk about the mainstream media making mistakes all the time. It's a thing that we're all going through right now. Like, you know, we're, we're just constantly doing interviews for, for Canadian media right now. And a thing that always gets messed up is they ask me how the three different formats work. And so I explain succinctly, and in my opinion, and I give a good explanation on how speed climbing, bouldering, and lead climbing works. But then they take that and use it as an explanation for like how it works if you go climbing at your local gym. So all of a sudden, there's like newsreels going out across the country saying, yeah, when you lead climb, you only have six minutes to get to the top. And like dumb, dumb shit like that where people just don't have a full understanding of what's going on. And so I think some of the clickbait is trying to be clickbait and some of it is just people not knowing what's going on. Um, yeah. yeah, it is unfortunate. Yeah, it's 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 almost like are we talking about the content of the article or are we talking about the the like the grabby kind of sensational? Nobody sell reads the content; of... they all just read the headlines. I, right. I, it's, <laughs> it's the headlines for sure because See, quite often the content doesn't even. And, and we discussed this in a previous one yeah. with one that you had written, and you said you didn't even know what the headline was when it came out mm -hmm. because it's someone completely different is going to pick that up and. But you know, it's the it's the headlines are what people people will remember the article if it's a really good article, but most of the time they'll remember the headline because that's what gets slapped in their face when they open whatever social media they're using. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the classic example was I wrote something about 
in the lead up to the Olympics. I think it was in between the qualies and the final round. And I was writing, you know, predictions or whatever. I wrote a piece about predictions and I gave my five women that I thought could podium or whatever. And one of them is Brooke. And I put Brooke on there. And in the comments, the first thing somebody says, like, what about Brooke? And it's like, well, did you read the article or did you yeah. just like look at Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it's interesting, though, because I think back to when I used to work at magazines, print magazines, back in the prehistoric age. And to, to come up with a title, you would actually you would you would write a title and then you would stand, you would do what's called the newsstand test. So you would stand five feet away and read it. Does it grab you? You'd bring in somebody from the office. Okay, stand 10 feet away. Act like you're walking by this. Does this grab you? You would spend, no exaggeration, a whole week sometimes trying to refine the title and, and get it phrased just right. And now it's, you know, you, as the writer, you submit it and you don't even know a lot of times what the title's going to be. And, and I doubt that they put that type of meticulous care into, into coming up with these titles at any media outlet these days. And so it's just the media game has totally changed. Um, I know I sound like a, a grandpa saying that, but it's just it, – it's, it's put us in a really strange place, Eddie, when we're talking about – to kind of bring it back to the Olympics and, and the athletes. When we're talking about the role of media, the role of athletes, that line of like – being respectful, contributing or, or not contributing to their to their well-being. And, and it's just it's all interconnected, especially because we know they're all on their phones checking this stuff, uh, at least to some extent, like you like you said. Uh, without beating the, the comments thing uh, too much, because, yeah, I, I obviously do not read comments anymore after a few. It just made me want to blow my brains out. Um, I wanted to bring up a, a different uh, loser, which I, I feel like is a questionable one. It was at the bottom of my list of losers. And that was athletes that we didn't get to see compete in the 2021 season before the Olympics. Um, the ones that were stuck in quarantine or, or only got to compete once or twice. So the three main countries... Canada, not so much because I, I honestly didn't have particularly high expectations of Sean and Elena. I think they performed pretty much as well as I expected them to. Um, but countries like Korea and China, especially, um, Korea has two athletes that, you know, I think John Wan Chan had, an, uh, had a, like a pretty good qualifier, if I remember right. Um, and uh, Chai and So also had an excellent qualifier, just couldn't get it together in finals. But China, there was, you know, from what I had heard, and I hadn't heard much and it was all hearsay, but was that they were hitting like impressive times and that they were working really hard and, and that, that they like planned to come out as a contender. And, and those particular countries did not end up having a particularly good showing at, uh, at this event, considering where their level was previously. It's yeah. interesting you say that because I, um, I had heard, you know, I, I had big expectations of the Koreans and Chinese. And I think the Koreans met the expectations. Um, Chong Won Chon didn't quite get a, across the line. He ended up 10th, but still an admirable placement in a strong field. And um, I think um, Chan So was, what we, was where we expected. Um, but for the Chinese, I did hear it, probably just a week, week or so out from the games that they were actually quite worried that the lack of international interaction and training had probably negatively impacted their athletes' preparation. And I think we saw that when they did come out. But, you know, to hear that um, through the coaches quite close to the comp that, you know, maybe they're not that's, quite there, maybe they're half cooked. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but of course, at that stage, you never quite know whether people are playing mind games or not. Um, so, yeah, it's, you know, but I, yeah, the whole thing of, you know, we hadn't seen Osh or Tom at all. We hadn't seen, obviously, as you said, Sean Alana. Uh, we'd only had a very limited glance at Aaron and Christopher. So, yeah, it was a bit of a weird one going in. There was a lot of questions as yet unanswered. Even Shauna, you know, we'd only seen Shauna once and she had really struggled and she didn't end up making finals. But, you know, she came out and showed that she's still Shauna Coxie. She still got fourth in the bouldering, which I was jumping up and down for. I was so pleased for her. She felt like a real star when she was out there. I, and maybe this is, I, I feel like the commentators, for as much as we can be critical of some of the things they said, they really did, at least the broadcast I was listening to, they, the live stream, they did a great job of 
of painting her as like this is somebody really special and and you're seeing her on the mats for the last time uh it, it you know well done on their part especially because i don't think the commentators were climbers particularly um but they were but they british really, so. But they really sold. Maybe that played into it. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe they knew of her, her celebrity uh, or something. But uh, it was really cool watching her, even though the results weren't going her way. It felt like she was getting some some real g- deserved appreciation. She was getting the send off. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. Yep. And and you know to your uh, to your point, Tyler. The only thing I'll add is I was just really impressed with Cheon So. You brought her up, and and I know the. I almost feel like the results don't do justice to ha- to how impressed I was or to how well I think she did. She ended up getting eighth. You know, she gets last in the in the women's finalists there. But I think I'd have to do the the math. But I think that as she was climbing, they said something like, depending on what you know, she could get the bronze or something. It's kind of like the heartbreak of the multiplied system. She goes from potentially bronze to to the la- to last. But uh, as she's so young. To be able to climb with such poise, she never really looked nervous. She, she, I mean, she, she, she's kind of just uh, very stoic anyway. Uh, she, she always just kind of looks like she's cool as a cucumber uh, under pressure. And I, I don't know. I just, I kind of, I look at the results and I'm like, Chan is eighth. I feel like she climbed a lot better than that than that indicates. I, I was, I was impressed with her. And, and I think if anything, this proves that. Yep, she's still definitely going to be a force on the World Cup circuit. Like, we better look out this lead season. Um, oh, yeah, and I mean, first after, uh, sorry, second after qualifiers behind Yanya. Mm-hmm. You know, first in lead, fifth in bouldering. And being that that's only the second time we've ever seen her boulder after Hachioji in 2019, like that, you know, it bodes really well for the future. That's why, that's, I just want to say, that's kind of why for her I was disappointed, partly because I had put... Uh, you know, I had really knocked down the injured climbers on my list. Like, I think Miho Nanaka and Jesse Pills both overperformed what I thought they were going to do after those uh, after those injuries that we had seen this season. Same thing with Shauna Coxey. I definitely thought she would, wouldn't would have done as well in bouldering after her performance in Salt Lake City. Um, and Chai Hun, like, she demonstrated the last time we saw her that she was top tier if not the top lead climber in the world the last time that we consistently saw her i was hoping that i would see a lot of improvement in bouldering to make her you know close to top tier in bouldering and hopefully some improvement in speed and so i think it was my expectations that may have gotten a little too high considering that she was left on her own out there for so long um but yeah i was i was really hoping that she would be a a gold medal contender and she she almost was like she was pretty darn close I had her, I, I thought she was, I mean, again, as much as predictions matter for anything, I was thinking uh, between qualifiers and finals, I was thinking, yeah, maybe Cheon could actually get on the podium. Mm-hmm. Um, and and she's another case for, it's interesting, she qualified, remember, it was just that technicality of her place in Hachioji. There was no Asian Continental Championship. So looking at this, at the the pathway, if there was anybody who you could say, Oh yeah, they just kind of got in by luck, you know, like the the sure. just the countback luck that she got in. But she any anybody that was would have been critical in that regard, she silenced all the critics because she proved that she absolutely deserved to be there. I mean, she ends up making it to the finals. So, um I just want to applaud her. Yeah, for real. Well, if I if I'm not mistaken, the other one that came through a funny pathway like that was Anouk Jobe, yes. right? Because when there was no tripartite pick, yeah. then she got slid in due to her Hachioji finish. And, you know, would would she have come through the European champs? Who knows? So, yeah. It's, um, yeah, it's... Oh, man, we could talk all week about this, but people would get bored and switch off after 10 minutes. We need a catchy headline. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> what's the headline going to be? I don't know. <laughs> We'll pick we'll pick something about the flag for sure and, and make that the the uh, yeah anyway I I'll give you guys the opportunity if you have one if you have one last point you want to make and then uh, and then we'll wrap this up. Do either of you have anything you're just burning to uh, to add to the discussion? I have two one one well both will be very short. All right, let's do it. Okay, first OBS. Let's just make that its own podcast one day. 
because <laughs> but th there is too much to discuss and people will ask why haven't we discussed it more here mm -hmm. and it's because we were talking about the climbing mm -hmm. um but obs that that gets its own thing and secondly as i said at the beginning i had a winner's list a loser's list and a weird list and seeing nathaniel coleman come out for the podium dressed like he was like auditioning for nasa exactly like, i'm like oh this guy's blasting off after this i'm surprised he made time I, I, for a sorry, podium that, presentation th that will stay with me forever that yeah. was pretty surreal like yeah. obviously it's their outfit but i was pissing myself laughing that was a glorious moment yeah poor old captain america about to go to space yeah <laughs> Uh, two quick things. I, I just want to reiterate what Eddie said at the beginning of the of the stream here, which was just that I know there's crushed spirits and there's broken hearts and all of this, but it was just I think everybody that was in the Olympics as a climber should come away from this holding their head high uh, because they're all part of history. I don't know if any of them are going to listen to this, I, you know, but but I I really come away from it just being happy and proud for all of them to be honest and i'm not i'm not trying to be like sappy there i really feel that way i was it was really really fun to cheer for all of them to follow their whole journey um so that would be my one point my second point is uh i'd just like to say welcome to every a lot of new viewers i had a lot of people message me uh in the build up to the olympics that kind of, I think they discovered the debrief or they discovered Plastic Weekly and just amid the, the whirlwind of Olympic press and hype and all that. So I do think we have a lot of people. I don't know if they've, I don't know if they've stuck with us for the two and a half hours here, but if they're still listening, uh, hello and welcome to all the new, to, to all the new viewers. It's really cool that we've, that I had some people message me saying that they, they just found us or, or they just joined or whatever. So it's, that's awesome. That's really cool to hear. Watch this be the least watched episode we've ever had. Just, you just <laughs> cursed it. Right. I mean, you could also give a shout out to the podcast on climbing gold. If you wanted to, you know, you could say, yeah, my, uh, John Bergman from plastic weekly, but you know, it's still, it's still up to you. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna push the issue. I want to, I want to end with like, uh, just one, uh, one opportunity to just say a couple points. Cause Eddie, you brought up the broadcasting and, and frankly, we talk a lot about broadcasting cause you know, I guess I watch these from home. It's really important to me and we all want the sport to grow. And a big part of that is making this more presentable. Do you guys think that we have, put ourselves in a better position following this Olympics for like, that's not the right way to put this question. I are, do you feel like we hit the level that you expected us to be at for the Olympics for the way that we broadcast stuff? Or do you think we have kind of like uh, underperformed given how big a stage this was? Eddie, hmm. Eddie already shook his head. So I feel like I want to, I, I want to hear your thoughts and you can kind of summarize everything you were going to rant about in our, in that podcast suggestion. <laughs> Okay, no, I, I feel that we massively underperformed. Um, now, for starters, John has talked a lot about the narrative and building a story around everything. Uh, we really haven't seen a lot of that coming from the Federation in terms of building a picture which the media can then take and run with. And I know Natalie messaged me from the venue and said that uh, the MCs on site were reading the UKC profiles that Natalie, Charlie, and myself had written. They were reading them verbatim to describe the athletes. Why the hell are those the, the only athlete profiles available? Um, when I looked into it, there are some quite good Olympic ones as well, but I don't even know if they were ready or if uh, MCs knew where they were, but they were also just basically cut and paste of the work that ourselves and others had already done. But, you know, so from that perspective, I think we undersold. Uh, we didn't present the narrative in a clear enough, catchy enough way that the media could then take it and run with it if they didn't have an existing knowledge. Uh, the English language broadcasting, um, I was lucky enough, obviously, I worked a bit with the Canadian broadcasting and with some other broadcasting um, doing back-end stats and athlete profiles similar to what we're doing with UK, sorry, with UK Climbing. Um, and because of that, I actually tuned in and listened to the 
um, the Canadian feed most times because also CBC had the best coverage. And look, it was laughably bad. It was embarrassingly bad when it was the OBS guys. When it was the CBC guys, they were admirable. When it was the, uh, when it was the OBS guys, it was cringeworthily bad. And the fact that the person they had commentating it was the person that the IFSC had got rid of for Charlie really made me scratch my head. So Johnny had been the one of the commentators under 24-7 before Obsessed Media came in. And there was a lot of complaints and they just weren't fitting the bill. And when I saw he was down to be the commentator, I was like, what? Like, you know, he was dreadful six years ago. Um, so that stunned me but it was the reason he remembered names like Ramon Julian and dropped them in is because that's when he used to work with the climbers and in terms of the footage provided I thought it got better but I thought men's you know I literally saw posts online which I thought were great where someone said you should have sent Liam Loss um Liam Lonsdale out there with a cell phone recording you would have got better <laughs> um but yeah so the whole thing I think we massively underperformed. Um, and I know people go, oh, you're being negative. And the answer is I've seen much better quality. Um, you know, if you forget Arsgate from the Austrians, the Austrians generally have a very good quality of production, much better than what we saw from OBS. Um, we know there is a lot of good commentators, much better than the OBS. And you know, last night, so we in, it's Tuesday my time, right? So Monday your time, I guess, because you guys live in the past. Yes. Um, you know, last night at about midnight, the IFSC posted the Olympic woman's results up. Yeah. And they still haven't posted photos from the round. Sure. And, and I'm like, come on, this is like, you. it's the you had one job thing. Yeah. And I feel the athletes, the coaches, the root setters, everyone's turned themselves inside out to do the absolute best they could. And I don't know that that's been reflected all the way through. John, do you have any, uh, any reflections? I, well, the, the thing that I really wanted to see that I, or I should say that the thing that I was really excited about, I was expecting we would see uh, the, the history would be told the history of competition climbing i was i was excited i was like here we're gonna see some really cool documentaries with some really vintage world cup footage and all this stuff um it we started get... in 1930s oregon at the base of smith rock, uh, do, you have, smith rock do you have any yeah, other yeah. questions yeah like come on that's all the history there is to know well I, but i wanted even not just references on the bro i wanted like documentary like mini docs sure. you know i i thought we would get like stuff like that on the on the live stream itself we didn't really you know occasionally with brooke and whatnot they'd mention robin and and here and there but like we didn't get any real deep dive of this the the, the competitors that were that were climbing, they did not feel like they were the, the current version of a very f fantastic and, and, and kind of fascinating history. It kind of felt like comp climbing starts with them, right? Like where was the hmm. mention of Yuji Hirayama and where was the mention of Francois Legrand and like the, the, everything that preceded the competitors that were there on the wall. There's so much rich history that could have been told on commentary, in documentary form, in photos, we didn't get any of that. Now, I, I have to say, some of this, I wonder if how much the pandemic played into this. Right? It's hard to say. Like, like, would we have gotten a better broadcast, a different version of the broadcast, if the world had been normal, if working conditions had been normal, if people had been allowed to travel to put together documentaries and all this stuff? Like, I don't know. That's the big question mark for me. Uh, I suppose you can kind of give give some people the benefit of the doubt with some of this stuff. You can say like, yeah, it left a little bit to be desired, but you know, it was a pandemic and all that. Maybe that's maybe that's being overly generous on our part. I don't know, but I I I was really want you know me. I mean, all three of us here we're history buffs, and so I was like, oh, we're gonna get some awesome vintage footage and and some interviews with some of the legends and stuff, and didn't didn't get that. 
I think yeah. that I mean yeah I'll just pipe talk. in and then the the one thing that really crystallized with me which was frustrating like I like I I, I'm of two minds on the commentary because, you know, it's it's hard to do. And I, I think, like, it seemed like it was kind of a last-minute thing for them to get commentators f- for it. I, I'm not really sure what happened there because there were people that, was, uh, that were technically available uh, to do this. And I'm not really sure why that uh, why it came down to people that had been rejected for, for lesser jobs in the past. Um, but at the same time, I didn't hear any complaints about the commentators from people that were watching the sport new. And the, the parallel I'm trying to draw with myself is I really liked watching skateboarding, but I don't know anything about skateboarding. And the people I know that do know skateboarding thought it was shit and they thought the commentators were garbage. And I didn't tell the difference. I just had a good time watching. And so I'm trying to keep that perspective in mind before roasting them. The commentators were not the people I want to listen to, but maybe maybe they did the job for others like stylistically they were very different from commanda and brenda obviously uh the the boys uh from the uh, olympic broadcast service they brought a lot more hype and loudness and you know i'm yelling at you the whole time and that might be what some people needed to to enjoy the sport for the first time but the one thing that that just tells me that we are not doing a good job of communicating with people that share our sport is is just basics of camera work of of not be being able to put on the screen the thing that is relevant and the bouldering round for men's qualifier is like the ultimate example of this is like guess what if you can't if like if if it all comes down to it just show a full body shot like fuck the zoom in shit on one particular hold like i don't need to like see what your like upside down undercling gaston move is or whatever right like all i want to i just want to see the move i want to see where his feet are and where his hands are and what happens because if he falls i want to know which part fell and i don't want to have a zoom in of like just like the footholds for a second and have no context of like oh he's on the mat now i couldn't see that i have no idea like we we must do a better job of explaining to camera people hi this is this is a sport where it's really important to have the entire body in the frame so until you get really good at this and you understand when it looks like a climber might fall when a climber might move when a climber might rest for now just chill the fuck out and get all four points in your camera shot and that will do better than whatever habits you have from from other sports so that's the yeah, one when that I watch the BMW, me. when I watch the BMX or skating, they don't focus on the skater's <laughs> sure. foot. Yeah. Well, he's doing a bunch of tricks. They show the skater. Mm-hmm. And, and the, uh, you know, sorry, you got me ranting now. You're in trouble. It's um, fine. <laughs> I just cleared out my hard a, drive so fa- we can record forever. What, it's good. What a fantastic, you know, graphics layovers that told us great things like the angle around an arete. They didn't tell us how <laughs> steep the wall was, but it was 212 <laughs> degree arete. Holy shit. And, and this yeah. hold is 12 centimeters wide. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't matter how wide it is. It matters that, that how hold much... was not 12 centimeters wide, by the way, whatever that yeah. screw on jib was. I was like, no, I've climbed yeah. in that. That ain't 12 centimeters, man. <laughs> yeah. That was definitely uh, I mean... a leftover from whatever the previous set was or some shit. So again, it comes down to the lack of understanding. I was looking at that going that these you've, you've got a graphics overlay and you're putting a bunch of stuff up that has no relevance. Mm -hmm. You know, you're not even saying the steepness of the wall. You're saying the, the obtruse angle around an arete. Mm -hmm. Um, But I, I am going to completely plagiarize a comment on the UK for climbing forum here. Uh, So apologies to the author if they do end up listening to this and find me reading the olympics can steal uk climbing material then you can certainly steal uh, stuff from from, from their comment section um because i thought this was a beautifully said comment and so i i actually copied it into a message to someone but i'll read it now so the the person goes yeah i was thinking this despite knowing nothing about bmx i still enjoyed the commentary not once the commentators felt the need to say oh look they done a jump and spun around that's loads harder than cycling to Tesco's. <laughs> Unlike climbing, which seemed to entirely comprise of inane nonsense about how it's harder than going to the gym, how hard the sm- holds are, sorry, how small the holds are, or how big the muscles are. They lost me at, he's just done a pull up. And then someone else goes, I quite like the idea of this, comparing world class athletes to mundane daily tasks. 
weightlifting. <laughs> Much harder than putting those cans on the top shelf. Swimming. Less like being in the bath than you might think. <laughs> uh... and, and, and that kind of that summed up the commentary to me because they kept bringing it back to just these ignorant comparisons. You know, they've got fingers as strong as legs. <laughs> Uh, I've forgotten yeah. about half of these. You know, that's uh, just, you know, a Gaston is an upside down undercling. Yeah. And just, you know, they were the gift that keeps on giving, but for all the wrong reasons. Yeah. I, I think the real, yeah, you come away from it. I, I think part of the frustration with it is, and overall, I'll be clear, I thought it was, it was a fine start to climbing's Olympic inclusion. But I think what we, you you come away from it thinking, but it could have been so much better with a, just a little bit of, uh, I don't want to say so much better, but it could have been better with just a little bit of, of tweak here and there, a little bit of consulting certain people. Yeah. I, I, yeah. Um, I, I don't know. I think, I, I, think I think your sentiment is like entirely fair. Like, I mean, you know, yeah, we're at the Olympics. That's amazing. It, it does just baffle me that these like fairly basic issues, you know, don't don't come across that that gets really frustrating. So it's a mix of both. Obviously, I'm not discounting either either side. But uh, but yeah. All right. We're, we're at two minutes, two hours and 40 minutes. So we should probably wrap this up. This has been uh, this has been a, a long one, but what comp could possibly deserve it more than our debut at the uh, Olympics? We, you know? we talked about three disciplines. Exactly, yeah. We're going to have to do this again for the World Championships. Holy shit. Um, God damn. Uh, yeah, well, uh, today we've... Uh, I forget how to end the show because this show has been so long. I forget what, what show is this. Okay, how are we going to do this? So... Thank you very much for watching the debrief. Um, I'm as always. I'm Tyler Norton. Uh, John Bergman is always the co-host, and uh, Eddie Falk joining us again for his third time this season, doing work uh, from uh, from New Zealand. So thank you both for uh, for joining us. I want to give a quick shout out to uh, uh, Oland Eleven in the Plastic Weekly Discord. He won our Olympic predictions. Can't remember what score he got, but he did a great job. I'm pretty nice. sure he called the women's podium and then did an awesome job in the men's end as well. Uh, so good for him. Of course, join the Plastic Weekly Discord. It's where we watch competitions together. We we make some friendly wagers and we uh, we make lots of jokes about whatever's going on on the stream. Most of us are there and, and lots of other fun people to talk to as well. You can support this podcast by liking this video, leaving a comment, uh, which at least one of us will probably read uh, or uh, supporting us on Patreon where you can send a couple dollars uh, uh, and earn some stickers. Or even if you're a big spender, you can earn a guest spot on a show like this. Wouldn't that be fucking nuts if we just had some Very random cool. viewer on the show with nothing to add? Um, so that could be Ty you. If Tyler, that... <laughs> you're making lactic acid t-shirts, right? That's the rumor <laughs> I... Lactic weekly, yeah, baby. Yeah. We're getting the, <laughs> the lactic weekly shirts going. Uh, yeah, that'll be a, a new um, a new tier. So anyway, the Patreon, leave a comment, join the Discord. I think that's pretty much it. Of course, if you haven't subscribed, subscribe for more because let's say this is your first time watching the debrief and your first time watching competition climbing. Well, have I got news for you? The climbing season continues starting September 5th in Kron, Slovenia, uh, where hopefully we'll see Janja Garnbrett and some of the Slovenians fighting in an incredible lead comp on, I think, a new wall uh, on home soil. Not not a, Not a new wall? They didn't... No, that, so it was supposed to be in Ljubljana. Yeah, but due to restrictions, they've moved it back to the old wall and crown for this year. But didn't they move it to Ljubljana because they were rebuilding the crown wall? Like uh, they were building a new one. Isn't that what I remember? I might be anyway. I don't, at least, I don't think at least matter. one of us is wrong, and it could be both of us. It, it's all good. So more competition climbing coming this season. You can watch it with us on the Discord. Thank you very much for watching. Thank you everybody for joining us, and we'll see you as always in the next one.